Russia has a habit of boasting about its military capabilities. Before the war in Ukraine, many international observers were worried about Russia's new equipment, like the T-14 Armata tank, Su-57 Felon fighter, and even its infantry body armor like the Ratnik that was in service and the Sotnik that was supposedly in development. These systems made Western national security experts fear that Russia's military buildup under Putin would transform Moscow's military into a modern combined arms fighting machine, dragging it out of Soviet-era incompetence. Unfortunately for the Kremlin, the claims about the T-14, Su-57 and new body armors never materialized on the battlefield, and they were far from the only ones. Russia had also been boasting about a so-called doomsday submarine and a torpedo capable of creating a tsunami. But what are these, and is there any truth behind the claims? In this video, we'll take a look at Russia's doomsday sub, tsunami torpedo, and why these are likely also examples of false advertising. As of December 2023, Russia has 58 submarines in its naval fleet. Unfortunately, many of these submarines are aging, some of them are Soviet-era submarines well over 30 years old. To keep its submarine force modernized, post-Soviet Russia laid down the Belgorod-class nuclear submarine in July 1992. The Belgorod would be based on the Oscar II-class submarine. However, in a sign of things to come, the craft suffered for almost 30 years in developmental hell. The project originally began as a guided missile submarine, designed to threaten American carrier groups, and there were supposed to be multiple vessels in the class. The Belgorod and its sister vessels would use P-700 granite ship-killing missiles, of which they were supposed to be armed with 24. A Belgorod-class sub would shoot all of these missiles at the same time. The lead missile of the 24 would send targeting data back to the other 23 behind it, and if the missiles were intercepted, the next one would be able to take its place. A fleet of prototype Belgorod-class submarines would present a blizzard of missiles at enemy fleets. However, in 1997, the Russian Ministry of Defense halted the program amid the country's post-Soviet financial difficulties. The Russian MOD still intended to finish work on what would become the Belgorod, though, and kept training crew members with that goal in mind. The financial difficulties proved tougher than expected, though, and the nascent submarine spent years idling in the port of Severodvinsk. The sinking of the Belgorod's sister ship, the Kursk, put further stress on the project. As late as 2004, only the outer hull was finished. The keel-laying ceremony did not happen until 2012. At that time, the Belgorod's mission began to change. The submarine morphed from a ship killer into a special purpose platform as part of Russia's Naval Special Operations Unit. This change in designation previewed a change in the submarine's design. The Belgorod got bigger by 30 meters and was to become armed with a very different type of weapon. The submarine was finally launched in April 2019, after a series of supposedly satisfactory trials in June and July of 2021, the Belgorod was commissioned into the Russian Navy in July 2022. With a length of 184 meters and a width of 18.2 meters, it is the largest submarine in active service around the world. The vessel displaces 14,700 tons on the surface and 24,000 tons when underwater. It can dive to a depth of 520 meters and can remain beneath the waves for about four months thanks to being nuclear-powered. It has a top speed of about 32 knots, or roughly 37 miles per hour. The submarine comes with a crew of 110 sailors. Built by Sev Mash, which is a subsidiary of the Russian joint stock company United Shipbuilding, the Belgorod has multiple roles. According to the Russian MOD, it can conduct search and rescue operations, do research, and act as a strategic deterrent with its six 2M39 Poseidon torpedoes. The Poseidon torpedo, whose name was chosen based on a web contest held by the Russian Ministry of Defense and is also known by the NATO callsign Canyon, was first revealed in 2015. This reveal was supposedly not intentional, but rather came from a camera shot of a document in the hands of a Russian general that outlined the Belgorod submarine and the Poseidon torpedo. Tellingly, at the time it was revealed, Putin was making a speech decrying the United States and its plans to expand its missile defense capability. The CIA believes that the leak of this information was therefore intentional as a roundabout warning. Either way, the purpose of the Belgorod and its torpedo became clear in that moment. The United States has systems which can track essentially any missile launched on Earth. Even China's hypersonic missile tests in the summer of 2021 
which scared a lot of people in Washington, were detected by these radars. A Poseidon torpedo, on the other hand, would be much more difficult to detect if one were not actively looking for it. Without advanced warning, it would be hard for American defenses to counter. To further help it avoid detection, the Russians claim that the Poseidon is equipped with stealth technology that evades American underwater sound tracking systems that it deploys in the oceans. Although the Poseidon is ordinarily noisy, the noise is of the profile of civilian ships, making it harder for the United States Navy to distinguish the threat from all the routine commercial traffic in the world's waterways. Russian sources further suggest that the Poseidon torpedo can automatically slow down to a low speed of about 3 km per hour when it's closing in on its target, making it more difficult to detect and counter in the final moments. The Poseidon's developer is Russia's Rubin Design Bureau. Putin officially confirmed that the torpedo was under development in 2018 when he boasted that it could surpass American defenses. It is nuclear-powered and can travel at ranges exceeding 10,000 kilometers by remote control. The torpedo can even move autonomously and is enhanced by AI thanks to housing advanced guiding sensors and obstacle avoidance sonar systems. These navigation systems integrate with the GLONASS satellite array in space, which is Russia's equivalent to the American GPS network of satellites. If everything is as advertised, the Poseidon torpedo can roam around undetected for up to seven months thanks to its nuclear reactor. The nuclear fuel in the onboard reactor can last for 20 years, although the torpedo itself needs upkeep every seven months. Once the seven-month deployment period is over, Russian sources claim that the torpedo can make its way back to home port on its own. Once there, manned ships will recover it and its crews will do the appropriate maintenance on it to make it seaworthy again. Because of the nuclear reactors that power it, the Poseidon can reach speeds of 70 knots, 80 miles per hour on land, According to the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, the torpedo's speed might even reach as high as 100 knots or 185 miles per hour. This would make it faster than NATO's submarines and torpedoes. The torpedo has a length of 24 meters and a diameter of 1.6 meters. It can operate at a depth of over 1 kilometer. A single Poseidon torpedo can carry a 2 megaton nuclear warhead. This is a yield approximately twice as powerful as the most potent bomb currently in the United States nuclear arsenal, the B-83. Some early reports suggest that if need be, the Belgorod submarine can carry up to 100 megatons of nuclear warheads between its Poseidon torpedoes, a yield twice that of the 1961 Tsar bomber, the most powerful nuclear weapon ever detonated. If true, this would indeed make the Belgorod and its ammunition the terror of naval bases and coastal cities. In 2020, Christopher Ford, the Trump administration's Secretary of State for International Security and Non-Proliferation feared that the Poseidon torpedo could inundate U.S. coastal cities with radioactive tsunamis. An April 2022 Congressional Research Service report indicated that the Belgorod and its Poseidon torpedoes were intended as second-strike retaliatory weapons, rather than a first-strike option. The theory went that if Russian nuclear capability was significantly damaged in a first strike, the Belgorod and its Poseidon torpedoes would still be at sea, ready to go. However, the Poseidon's actual mechanics suggest a different purpose that we will get into before the end of the video. It's also worth noting that although the torpedo is most formidable as a nuclear deterrent, the Poseidon is also capable of hosting conventional warheads. Although its nuclear mission is the most formidable, the Belgorod can conduct a host of other undersea special operations and house the equipment needed to do so. In this capacity, the Russians claim that the Belgorod is also capable of hosting nuclear-powered midget submarines. These vessels are useful for surveillance missions or operations against critical underwater infrastructure, such as cutting pipelines or internet cables or wiretapping the latter to collect intelligence. The Belgorod can attach a single deep-diving Loscherich midget submarine underneath its hull. Also interesting for modern purposes, the Belgorod is supposed to be capable of acting as a drone mothership. With this purpose in mind, the vessel was redesigned in 2017 to replace the missile compartment with a longer container capable of storing underwater drones. The original 154-meter submarine therefore increased to its present length. In fact, the Poseidon torpedoes are considered drones. However, the Belgorod has also been thought capable of exceeding this purpose in its drone capacity. It can supposedly field autonomous underwater vehicles. These vehicles are the Harpsichord 2PPM model, which carry a plethora of sonars to scan the sea floor 
for the aforementioned infrastructure. The Harpsichord Autonomous Underwater Vehicle AUV, has a length of 6.5 meters, a diameter of 1 meter, and a range of about 27 nautical miles. Some estimates suggest that the Harpsichord can operate at a depth of 6,000 meters, but more modest reports say that 2,000 meters is the likeliest number. The Harpsichord has mostly been associated with under-ice missions in the Arctic, but it's also been known to operate with the Black Sea and Pacific fleets of the Russian Navy. It was first tested in 2016 and originally designed for deployment from surface vessels, but has been adapted to the Belgorod. The Harpsichord was, according to Russian sources, designed for a dual-use purpose. It could conduct reconnaissance for the Navy or even do scientific research, which is mostly a label for more clandestine underwater intelligence operations. The addition of the Harpsichord to the Belgorod gives it more eyes under the water, increasing its ability to gather intelligence at a low risk to itself and its crew. In a sign of its importance to the Russian hierarchy, the Belgorod and its crew does not report to the Russian Navy's commanders. Instead, they report directly to Putin, which is consistent with the vessel's special operations purpose. Although it was primarily designed to operate in the Pacific, in September 2022, the Belgorod was spotted in the Arctic. Military officials in Europe were warning that the submarine was traveling to the Kara Sea to conduct tests of the Poseidon torpedo, sparking fears, although there was no indication that the torpedoes would be detonating nuclear weapons. Two months later, however, American military sources reported to CNN that the Belgorod returned to port without carrying out the Poseidon tests. The sources believed that the Russians had encountered technical difficulties and the torpedoes failed to launch. With the waters of the Arctic freezing over for the winter in the immediate aftermath, the Belgorod and the Poseidon laid low. But what has the Belgorod been up to since the autumn of 2022? In January 2023, the Russian Navy took its first deliveries of the Poseidon nuclear torpedoes. That month, Russia also completed some pop-up tests of the Poseidon drone torpedo. These exercises tested the mass-dimensional model of the Belgorod's torpedoes, gauging their performance at different depths after firing. At the end of June 2023, the Belgorod was reported as sailing out of Severodvinsk in the Russian Arctic. Although this movement coincided with the Wagner Rebellion, it is thought to be unrelated. At the time, the Belgorod was supposedly attempting more sea trials of the Poseidon torpedo. The Kremlin went ahead with this mission without notifying the United States. This was unusual, because historically, the two Cold War superpowers would notify the other about strategic weapons tests to prevent misinterpretation or miscalculation. Russian sources later reported that the Poseidon's nuclear reactors worked according to their design and the torpedoes' operability and safety have been confirmed. These reports came by way of the Russian state news agency RIA Novosti on June 23rd. Sea tests of the Poseidon torpedo drone were supposedly scheduled for later in the summer. However, little evidence exists that the torpedo was actually tested at sea as of the end of 2023. Even if the Belgorod and all of its systems worked as advertised, there is a glaring problem, similar to those seen in the Su-57 Felon and T-14 Armata programs, a lack of numbers. Russia has only one Belgorod submarine in its fleet. Given its long period of development and international sanctions following the invasion of Ukraine, it's unlikely that Russia will be able to build any more of these submarines. With only one Belgorod in service, the submarine can be easily tracked by satellite surveillance. All it needs to do is surface and leave its port, and international observers will have a decent idea of what the Belgorod will be up to next. Russia has also been hesitant to deploy its supposedly latest and greatest equipment in battle, as seen by the absence of the T-14 Armata on the battlefields of Ukraine and the Su-57s not flying over the disputed airspace. The Belgorod has likewise played no part in the war. The Russian MOD will likely not want to risk this submarine, which took almost 30 years to develop, making it something of a white elephant to the Russian Navy. There are also many reasons to think that the Belgorod and Poseidon do not work as well as the Russians claim. First and foremost, there is physical and technical cause to question many of the Russians' claims regarding the Poseidon torpedo. For example, the supposed tsunami effect is certainly false. A yield of even 100 megatons would not be enough to create a tsunami if the detonation were to occur in waters close to shore. This is not to say that the Belgorod's offshore nuclear detonation would not be dangerous. The wave cresting into the port or coastal city would still contain enough radioactive material 
to make the area uninhabitable for about 100 years, according to James Mack, a former nuclear and electronics technician in the United States Navy. While this more than modest claim is of little comfort, there are many other reasons to be skeptical that the torpedo works as advertised. The Poseidon torpedo, despite being so large, is nevertheless likely not large enough to house a big enough nuclear reactor to keep it at sea for as long as its designers claim. Furthermore, the Poseidon's architecture would need to shield its advanced AI and navigational systems from the radiation produced by the nuclear reactor. Although a smartly designed structure could in theory provide this shielding, it would place limits on the torpedo that would make it less effective than the Russian MOD claims. The nuclear reactor on board the torpedo itself is also questionable. Existing nuclear reactors work by converting the energy from fission, the splitting of atoms, into heat. This heat energy then turns water into steam. The steam then moves the turbines, which produce electricity, and in the case of a nuclear submarine, propulsive force. The Poseidon torpedo, despite being as large as a school bus, is still too small to carry the equipment that would recreate this complicated process. Mack further states, There are ways around some of this, but those produce massive amounts of waste heat and leave a rather clear thermal trail for a number of satellites, not just military versions. So the Poseidon torpedo is up against the horns of a dilemma. It can increase in size to house the traditional nuclear reactor, which would make it impractical for a submarine launch torpedo, or it can use a mitigation process that would make it easily detectable and lose its stealth qualities. Russian engineers would need to be very good indeed and using exotic technology if the torpedo were to contain all the features that Moscow says it has. Previously, we noted that the Congressional Research Service classified the Poseidon as a second-strike nuclear weapon. Mack disagrees with this assessment. The Russian claims about the Poseidon would make it fast for a torpedo, but it's still far too slow to be a retaliatory weapon against a nuclear first strike. Instead, the Poseidon better fits the profile of a fundamentally first-strike weapon. According to Mack, in peaceful conditions, monitoring for devices like the Poseidon is more relaxed. They can only be effective if they can get in position before they are being hunted, and as that position requires that they reach the target harbor, being too far out would just dissipate the energy instead of building it as in a 2MT size, the energy needs to be focused more tightly to get a large enough wave effect and focus the radioactive contaminants into the target city. And once this Poseidon torpedo is at speeds of 100 plus knots, it will not be able to hide. Water density on the submerged object at those speeds requires significant propulsion and would have to be at a significant depth to avoid cavitation, yet in general coastal areas are shallow comparatively. So either this is actually a first strike weapon, or the intended purpose is not to target a coastal city. Mack's words seem to be proven in the actual conduct of the Russian Navy in its use of the Belgorod submarine and Poseidon torpedo. As of the end of 2023, there are still no reports of actual sea tests of the Poseidon. No evidence of this device patrolling the waters of the open ocean is currently available. Given Russia's long history of lying about its weapon systems, we would be downright foolish to take the claims of the Belgorod and Poseidon torpedo at face value. Basic physics should tell us that not everything is as the Kremlin claims. Additionally, the Belgorod has shown problems in its more modest mission of being a mothership to midget submarines and drones. For example, in July 2019, the Losharik submarine suffered a battery failure during trials off Russia's Arctic coast. Fourteen of the crew members on the submarine died in this accident, which Putin called a great loss. The accident poses questions about the Losharik's operability. Meanwhile, the Belgorod is not expected to be able to exercise its Losharik host capability until at least 2025. No test of the Losharik deployment from the Belgorod is yet reported as having taken place. Given the long history of delays in Russia's military programs, we might expect this timetable to lengthen. In sum, the Belgorod and its associated capabilities are much like Russia's other supposedly modern weapons programs. There are many boastful claims, but so far, there is little effective proof suggesting that the Kremlin is doing more than bluffing. But what do you think about the Belgorod submarine and its unique ammunition? What is the real purpose of the Poseidon torpedo and can it possibly work in a way that even resembles what Russia claims? Don't forget to let us know in the comments. Also make sure to hit the like button and subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. Before February 24, 2022, the Russian Federation looked like it would deploy or soon be able to field some pretty formidable new weapons. 
in everything from fifth-generation fighter jets to modern tanks to new body armor and even tsunami-causing nuclear torpedoes. There was enough hype to make even informed Western national security experts worry about what they were seeing. Little wonder that they believed Ukraine would fall in days in the months prior to the invasion. Those predictions did not turn out to be the case. And now two years later, Russia still finds itself fighting a war of attrition with no end in sight. In this video, we'll take a brief look at how Russia's military arsenal has failed to live up to the hype, and why it has failed, and even why some of the weapons Russia claims it's developing will likely not perform as advertised. If they can build them at all, that is. Russia has one aircraft carrier, the Admiral Kuznetsov. The Admiral Kuznetsov began its life in the 1980s and was commissioned in 1991, just before the Soviet Union's collapse. However, this carrier is not of the same quality as the US Navy's aircraft carriers, which use a catapult system to rapidly launch their planes. Instead, it uses the STOBAR, Short Takeoff Barrier Arrested Recovery System, which makes its planes far slower to launch than the American Nimitz and Ford-class carriers, or China's Fujian. The Admiral Kuznetsov has also been plagued with problems, with frequent deadly accidents. The ship has been under repairs since 2018, with one delay piled onto another. It was originally supposed to return to service in 2021, but obviously that did not work out as planned. The ship is finally supposed to return to service in 2024, but that date is still questionable. Corruption has also plagued Admiral Kuznetsov's repairs. Three years ago, the director of the Murmansk shipyard was arrested on suspicion of embezzling rubles, the equivalent of $600,000. Such corruption is rampant in the Russian military and has long proven a problem with weapons development, logistics, and maintenance. The Admiral Kuznetsov saga is a good way to start the video because it reveals deeper problems in the Russian Navy, which include outdated equipment, incompetence, and corruption which have all played out in the war as seen in Ukraine's success against the Black Sea Fleet, despite having no navy of its own. Russia's surface navy is in poor shape in other ways. It is steadily retiring its Soviet-era ships and replacing them with lighter, less combat-worthy vessels. This process is slowly but surely causing the Russian navy to lose its blue water capabilities and confining it closer to the coasts. One of the ways that Russia has attempted to mitigate this trend is through a new class of destroyer, the Lyder class. If completed, the Leider-class destroyer could prove a formidable new addition to the Russian Navy. It would weigh 19,000 tons and be powered by nuclear propulsion, making it twice as large as the Soviet-era destroyers it would be replacing. It would even be larger than the three Slava-class cruisers in service with the Russian Navy. The ship's size would make it capable of supporting new weapons, such as the 3M22 Sirkon winged anti-ship hypersonic cruise missile, which is a naval version of Russia's S-500 air defense system. The Leider class would also be able to field the Packet NK torpedo and Packet MTT anti-torpedo. The offensive version can hit targets up to 10 kilometers away, improving the range on Russia's previous torpedoes, with a much more accurate targeting system. If the Leider and its classmates were to come online, it would be a big improvement over the Russian Navy's current ships. Unfortunately for Moscow, this new destroyer has suffered from numerous delays. The Leider-class destroyer was first revealed in 2015, with Western experts seeing it as an attempted answer to the United States' Zumwalt-class destroyers, then under construction. Unfortunately for Russia, these new destroyers have not taken to the sea, in fact, they have not even begun construction nearly 10 years later. Construction on the new class of destroyer was finally supposed to begin in 2023, but that year has now come and gone. The LIDAR project was even dropped from the Kremlin's 2025 state armament program, which made foreign defense experts question its future. Russian sources claim that its being dropped from the state armament program did not mean that the LIDAR had been cancelled, but rather that funding for it had been reduced. As of 2024, we cannot know when, if ever, construction will begin, and therefore that the Russian Navy will continue to get smaller and lighter as its older and heavier ships get retired. The problems for the Russian Navy go deeper than the surface vessels. Its underwater fleet is also aging, and its supposed newest and greatest submarine is also probably an item that owes its reputation more to advertising than performance. The Belgorod submarine, and particularly its Poseidon torpedo, are two other items of hype in the Russian Navy that don't seem to stand up to scrutiny. The Belgorod and Poseidon have often been items of fear in Western media and national security circles, which have nicknamed the former Russia's Doomsday Submarine. According to the Kremlin's hype, 
the submarine and its arsenal of smart drone Poseidon torpedoes can unleash a 100 megaton yield capable of creating radioactive tsunamis that would inundate coastal communities and make them unlivable. However, tests of the Poseidon have seemingly proven less than satisfactory. That shouldn't be too surprising, because for the Poseidon torpedo to work as the Russians claim, it would need to be able to house all of the equipment needed for a nuclear reactor to convert atomic fission into electricity and propulsive force, while ensuring negligible waste heat to avoid detection. It would also need the hardware to shield its sensitive electronics from the nuclear fission process. Unfortunately for Moscow, the torpedo is too small to do this, meaning that it's either an object of hype or Russian engineers have come upon a technological leap enabling exotic engineering methods. We'll let you decide which of the two scenarios is likelier. Meanwhile, even if the Poseidon's yield was 100 megatons, which it almost certainly is not, it would still not be large enough to generate the type of tsunamis the Russians claim it can. Instead, the likeliest scenario is a yield of about 1 to 2 megatons per torpedo, which would be enough to inundate a coastal area with dangerous radioactive waters but not create a tsunami. The Poseidon torpedo also faces engineering problems with its supposed speed. With a purported speed of 100 knots or 185 miles per hour, the Poseidon would be faster than all of the torpedoes in the arsenals of NATO member countries. However, if it were to go that fast, the torpedo would be easily detectable to sonar equipment, emitting noises far beyond the level of civilian ships that it would ordinarily try to hide behind. The torpedo would also have difficulty fulfilling its mission at the shallow depths which it would need to navigate in order to target coastal cities, which is its purported function, according to James Mack, a former nuclear and electronics technician with the United States Navy. If the Poseidon were to be traveling at its advertised speed of 100 knots or more in depths that shallow, it would not only be detectable because of the high heat it would generate, but also suffer from cavitation, the formation of vapor cavities in a liquid when it has been accelerated to high velocities. Cavitation can create shockwaves that damage machinery, meaning that the Russians have either compensated for this with unknown new engineering techniques and technology, or the claims of the Poseidon again do not stand up to scrutiny. This will be far from the only time in the video where this dilemma presents itself in relation to a Russian weapon system. There is also only one Belgorod submarine, meaning that it can easily be tracked by satellite surveillance when it needs to dock for upkeep. From this surveillance, intelligence analysts have a good chance of guessing its mission. International defense experts guessed just that when Belgorod conducted its exercises in the autumn of 2022, for example. We now journey from the sea to the skies and look at the Russian answer to the American fifth-generation F-22 and F-35 fighter jets, the Su-57 Felon. To be fair, the Su-57 does have some impressive features, like its 3D thrust vectoring engines, climb rate of 64,000 feet per minute, 66,000-foot service ceiling, Mach 2 speed, and a range of 2,186 miles without refueling. In a plane versus plane battle, the Su-57 should be a capable opponent against any fighter plane on the planet. However, the Su-57 has a big drawback, its comparative lack of stealth. Aviation experts regard the Su-57 as being by far the least stealthy of the fifth-generation fighters currently in service. For example, the F-22 Raptor is detectable at a range only under 10 miles, while the Su-57 would be detectable at a range of 35 miles. Its stealth features are also concentrated in the front of the plane, meaning that if it turns or maneuvers, it's far more detectable. Some aviation experts are even less kind and believe the Su-57's radar cross-section is similar to that of the F-A-18 Super Hornet, which is 1,000 times less stealthy than the F-35 Lightning II. Therefore, they say the Su-57 is not a true fifth-generation fighter jet, but rather an advanced fourth-generation one. The lack of stealth means that advanced radars from other fighter jets or air defense systems are capable of detecting the Su-57 and destroying it from long range. These weaknesses seem to be confirmed by the way Moscow has used the new felons it has in service. The Su-57 has played little part in the war in Ukraine, as the Russian aerospace forces have refused to field it in Ukrainian airspace. Instead, it has only attacked targets at long range from within Russian airspace. The limited use of the felon speaks volumes about the Russian brass's confidence in its stealth attributes, or lack thereof. It's also unlikely that the Russian military will be able to manufacture the felon in the numbers needed to make it truly formidable. The Kremlin ordered 76 Su-57s in 2019. 22 are in service as of December 2023, after several years of delays. 
It's difficult to see how Russia will field the Su-57 in adequate numbers anytime soon, giving it limited effectiveness as a means of making war. Russia is more well known for its tanks than its planes. However, the newest Russian tank has even more problems than the Su-57. To be fair, the T-14 Armata does have significant improvements over the tanks Russia has usually fielded in Ukraine, the T-72, T-80 and T-90. These tanks have been lost in their thousands during the fighting in Ukraine, thanks to bad doctrine and their own design flaws. Because they do not segregate their ammunition magazines in a sealed compartment, they have often suffered from complete destruction with jack-in-the-box explosions. The T-14 Armata mitigates this flaw with a protective capsule, isolating the crew from their vehicle's ammunition magazine. The vehicle's profile adds further protection, as its low silhouette avoids exposure of its parts to enemy fire. The Armata's main weapon is a 125mm 2A82-1M smoothbore gun, which can fire related rounds and laser-guided missiles. This weapon would be a significant threat to the Western main battle tanks that Ukraine began fielding in large numbers last year. Unfortunately for Russia, this gun is not backward compatible with its older tanks, which means that only the Armata can field it, and that's a problem because there has never been a confirmed sighting of the T-14 in Ukraine. Russia has even fewer T-14 Armata tanks than it does Su-57 fighter jets. From its inception, the tank has been mired in production delays. When it publicly revealed the tank in June 2015, Moscow claimed it would field 2,300 of them by 2020. That obviously never happened. In 2021, Russia promised serial production, but that didn't happen either. To date, only about 20 prototypes have been built. The T-14's engine in particular has proven to be an item of difficulty to manufacture. Unlike most of Russia's tanks, the Armata uses a derivative of the German X-shaped Simmering SLA-16 engine, which was designated as the A-853. However, this engine was not designed for a tank, but as a unit for compressor oil and gas pumping stations. Nevertheless, it was chosen as the basis for the Armata, and the tank was designed around this engine, rather than the other way around. While it had attractive features, being smaller and more powerful, though heavier than the standard Russian tank engine, it never truly proved adequate, and the Armata cannot be resized to fit Russia's proven and reliable tank engine, the V92S2F. The problem has presented a sunk cost fallacy to the Russian brass, as it has been reluctant to start on a new tank, instead struggling to find a way to make the engine problems work for the Armata. Meanwhile, the electronics for the Armata's sensory and fire control systems are no longer as widely available due to the sanctions put in place as a result of its invasion of Ukraine. Indeed, there has not even been an assembly line built for the Armata, and all of the prototypes have been made by hand. Given all of these problems, don't expect to see the Armata fielded in large numbers, if at all, anytime soon. The lack of a modern tank is a big problem for Russia because its current tanks have often found themselves outgunned on the battlefields of Ukraine as well as lacking adequate protection. Russia's tanks lack the range of their Western rivals because they cannot raise their guns as high. For example, the T-90, Russia's latest tank before the Armata, can only raise its gun by 14 degrees or lower it by 6 degrees. The Abrams, on the other hand, can raise its gun by 20 degrees and lower it by 9. The additional flexibility means that the Abrams can hit targets at longer ranges than the T-90 or the other tanks Russia can field in Ukraine in large numbers. The lack of gun mobility also makes the Russian tanks more vulnerable in urban combat than their American counterparts, as fighters can shoot down on them with anti-tank weapons from rooftops or high windows and leave the armor unable to retaliate. Russia learned this lesson the hard way in its wars in Chechnya around the turn of the millennium. Russia has been unable to modify its tanks since then, however, and has suffered from ambushes in the same way during the war in Ukraine. The combination of flaws in the ammunition storage and the lack of firepower and flexibility has left thousands of tanks destroyed in the war, and Russia cannot seem to mitigate this problem because it cannot manufacture the T-14 Armata in large enough numbers to change the situation. Russia could try to overcome these disadvantages with changes in doctrine, including deploying infantry and other units to better support its tanks in combined arms operations, but there is no indication that Russia has built a capacity to do so. Decades of Soviet deep battle doctrine and centuries of Russian reliance on mass to overwhelm an opponent, no matter the casualties, have proven too difficult for the Kremlin's military commanders to shake. Meanwhile, engineering problems apply not only to Russia's current military gear, but the ones it claims it has coming. For example, Russia's body armor has also been a subject of embarrassment. 
Many of Russia's soldiers, especially the conscripts Putin mobilized in the autumn of 2022, have lacked proper protection. Infamously, some Russian troops were issued airsoft versions of the Ratnik body armor. Despite its problems in this area, Russia has made some bold claims about what it has coming down the pike. Its next-generation Sotnik body armor, which it says will be able to stop a 50 caliber Browning machine gun round. The Sotnik armor is supposedly going to be made of polythylene plastic fibers to keep its weight down. Polythylene is effective against incoming rounds because as the material heats up from the energy transfer, the plastic melts, adhering to the bullet and slowing it down. The principle has proven effective in other body armor systems around the world, and indeed if there is enough polythylene, it could work in the same way against a 50 BMG round. However, a .50 BMG round transfers over 11,000 pounds of force onto its target, enough to punch holes through a cinder block wall. To say the least, it would require a lot of polythylene to put a stop to a round this powerful. Even accounting for improved efficiency, it's hard to believe that a soldier wearing this sort of armor would be mobile on the battlefield. Russian engineers would have a very tough hill to climb if they wanted to design a polythylene armor that would afford such protection against an incoming 50 caliber machine gun bullet and keep the wearer mobile. We should treat the Sotnik body armor with skepticism, to say the least. Another big example of engineering challenges built into Russia's future weapon systems comes with the sixth-generation fighter jet it supposedly has in the works, the MiG-41. According to the Kremlin, this jet will be the fastest aircraft in the world, with a cruising speed of Mach 4. If it works as Russia says, the fighter would also have a ceiling superior to any other aircraft at 85,000 feet. Unfortunately for Russia, the MiG-41 is almost certainly an example of a weapon that would never be able to work as it claims. If the MiG-41 were to fly at its cruising speed, let alone what it would reach with its afterburners, it would lose its stealth attributes. Supersonic flight creates high heat and friction. Such friction erodes the stealth materials that help to reduce the radar cross-sections of planes like the F-22 and F-35. Additionally, the heat signatures involved in such high-speed flight would make the MiG-41 easily visible to radar. Russian engineers would need to have exotic technology on their hands to mitigate such a weakness. Don't count on that. The MiG-41 is supposed to be an evolution of the MiG-31 Interceptor, which was designed to counter the American SR-71 Blackbird spy plane. It was built to reach speeds of Mach 2 for that purpose. The problem for Moscow is that an Interceptor is a far different order of business than a fifth-generation fighter, let alone a sixth, and the SR-71 has been retired from the American air fleet since the 1990s. Why the Russians would choose to develop their sixth-generation fighter from an outdated concept is puzzling and suggests that even without the engineering challenges to get it to work as advertised, the MiG-41 could suffer from the same problems as the T-14 Armata, a frame built around a questionable concept. According to the Kremlin, the MiG-41 will have its maiden flight in 2025 and begin delivery in 2028. But given Russia's long delays in introducing new weapon systems or even repairing existing ones, we should take those claims with a heavy grain of salt, to say the least, even if everything else supposedly works. What do you think about these failures of Russian military engineering? What other weapon systems from Russia have proven not to live up to the hype? Don't forget to let us know in the comments. Also, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for more military analysis from military experts. There has yet to be an aerial confrontation between two fifth-generation fighter jets, but tensions in Eastern Europe have now put them in the same arena, if not the same ring. Fighting out of NATO's corner is the F-35 Lightning II. Fighting out of Russia is the Su-57 Felon. If this fight became a reality, which one of these planes would win? First, let's take a look at the tail of the tape. The F-35 saw its genesis in the year 2001, when it was announced as the winner of the Joint Strike Fighter program, which began in the 1980s. The Lightning II is a multi-role fighter with several variants. The F-35A, conventional takeoff and landing plane, the F-35B, short takeoff and vertical landing plane, and the F-35C, carrier-based plane. The F-35A entered service in 2016, the F-35B in 2015, and the F-35C in 2019. It is a single-seat plane equipped with the Pratt & Whitney F-135 PW100 turbofan engine. 
It has a top speed of Mach 1.6, about 1200 miles per hour, and a range of 1700 miles per flight without refueling, a combat radius of 770 miles, and a service ceiling over 50,000 feet. The F-35 can climb at a rate of 45,000 feet per minute. Its payload includes all of the air-to-air -air and air-to-ground missiles in service and some of the bombs in the American arsenal. Normally, the plane can carry four missiles between its two internal weapons bays, though the coming F-35 Block 4 upgrade will increase that capacity to six. There are also six pylons, three on each wing, for the F-35 to carry additional munitions, although this would sacrifice the plane's stealth attributes. The F-35A comes with a 25mm gun and 182 rounds as a standard attribute. The F-35B and F-35C can, if need be, mount a 25mm gun on a pod. According to Lockheed Martin, the F-35's manufacturer, the Lightning II's maneuverability has improved significantly since the first batch of planes. Its turn rate is now superior to the fourth-generation fighters in the American air fleet such as the F-15 Eagle, F-16 Fighting Falcon, and the F-A-18 Super Hornet. The F-35 can perform attacks from all angles at either slow or high speeds and enter enemy turn circles rapidly. Meanwhile, the Su-57 Felon originated in the 1980s, as the Soviet Union wished to create a modern fighter jet to compete with the premier American fighters of the time, like the F-15 Eagle. The Soviet Union's collapse in 1991 disrupted the project but did not put a halt to it. The current plane began as the Pak-FA, future frontline aircraft system. The Kremlin planned for it to replace the MiG-29 and Su-27 while competing with the F-22 Raptor. The program began in 2001, with a prototype plane having its maiden flight in 2010. The first pre-production plane was delivered to the Russian Aerospace Forces in 2014. The Russians intended for the new aircraft to enter service in 2017 and reach full operational capacity in 2020 but it was not ready, despite the Russian brass ordering 76 of them in 2019. There are 22 of these planes in service as of December 2023. The Felon is a single-seat plane. It comes with twin Saturn AL41F1 turbofan engines capable of delivering 35,000 pounds of thrust individually, or about 64,000 pounds together. A twin-seat version of the aircraft may be on the way. The Su-57 has a purported top speed of Mach 2, or about 1,530 miles per hour. It has a service ceiling of 66,000 feet, a climb rate of 64,000 feet per minute, and a range of 2,186 miles without refueling. The Kremlin has not revealed any details about the plane's combat radius, although some aviation experts believe it's about 750 miles. The Felon can supposedly carry a higher payload than the F-35, with up to 7,500 kilograms, with 10 internal and 6 external holders for missiles and bombs. There is also a 30mm gun for dogfighting. To further assist it in close quarters combat, the Felon's engines have a 3D thrust vectoring feature. This feature allows an Su-57's pilot to control the outflow of the plane's engines, regardless of the aircraft's direction. In other words, the Su-57 might be flying in one direction, but the engine could be pointing in a different direction. This feature could be particularly useful in a dogfight, as it would allow the Felon to outmaneuver its opponent. The F-35 does not have 3D thrust vectoring. At first glance, the tail of the tape would seem to favor the Su-57 in a traditional match. The Felon has a higher maximum speed, climb rate, and altitude, can carry more weapons, has a longer range, and has 3D thrust vectoring engines to give it an edge in a visual range dogfight. If both planes wound up detecting each other, the advantage should swing to the Russian plane. This reality would be in line with the design of the two fighters. The F-35 is a multi-role plane, while the Su-57 is far more dedicated to air superiority, although it can adapt to other roles like attacking ground targets. However, dogfights are rare in modern warfare. While it would be premature to call them extinct, American military planners believed such a thing in the early 1960s, and those beliefs turned disastrous in the skies over Vietnam. The advent of stealth technology, longer-range missiles, and more sensitive radar means that visual-range plane battles will continue to become less frequent. 
Greater situational awareness, early detection, and ability to kill from long range are and will increasingly be the most important parts of establishing air superiority. In other words, spot the enemy and shoot him down from long range before he can spot you and do the same. The F-35 has its strengths in precisely these areas. The Lightning II is a true stealth aircraft. Aside from being coated in radar absorbent materials, everything about the plane's design is made for stealth, including its size. It's a relatively small plane, at 51.4 feet in length, 14.4 feet in height, a wingspan of 35 feet, and a wing area of 460 square feet. The face of the F-35's engine is concealed in a way to add further stealth. In all, the F-35 has a radar cross-section with the profile of a golf ball. The F-35 is even stealthier than the F-22, according to the USAF brass, and its radar-absorbent coating is more durable than the Raptors. Although the exact details are naturally classified, the F-22 can be detected at a range under 10 miles. The F-35 would therefore be even less detectable. Although it is also coated with radar-absorbent materials, the Su-57's design is much less stealthy than its American opponent, to the point that some aviation experts do not regard it as a true stealth plane or fifth-generation fighter aircraft. It is bigger than the Lightning II at 66 feet long and 15 feet high. Its wingspan is 46 feet with a wing area of 848 square feet. To be sure, the Su-57 has a much lower radar cross-section than the Russian fighter jets that preceded it. However, this stealth profile is mostly concentrated in the front of the plane. In contrast to the F-22 and the even stealthier F-35, the Su-57 can be detected at a range of 35 miles. However, the Su-57 might be even less stealthy than this, and we'll discuss those allegations at the end of the video. If the stealth features of the Su-57 are as advertised, the fella might be able to compete with the Lightning II if the two planes are approaching each other directly. However, if it were to turn or maneuver, the felon is much more detectable than the F-35. The felon would therefore have to try and detect the incoming American plane and shoot it down without exposing its sides or rear. The two planes missile armaments might be the deciding factor. For air-to-air -air combat, the F-35 can carry the AIM-9X Sidewinder for short-range engagements up to about 22 miles. The British AIM-132 ASRAM is also compatible with the F-35 and can hit shorter-range targets about 15 miles away. For longer range, the Lightning II can carry the AIM-120 AMRAM to hit targets about 65 miles away. In the future, the Block 4 F-35B variants will have the capability to be armed with the European MBDA Meteor, which can hit targets about 125 miles away, though this capacity is not expected until 2027. The F-35 will also soon be armed with the hypersonic AIM-260 JATAM, which can hit targets about 120 miles away. The new missile will be integrated into the F-35's potential armaments as it starts to enter service. The Su-57 can also be armed with a panoply of air-to-air -air missiles at different ranges. First, there is the R-73, for shorter distances up to 25 miles. For medium to longer range combat, the Su-57 can carry the R-77M, which can hit targets up to a range of 120 miles. Then there is the hypersonic R-37, which can hit targets at about the same distance with speeds of Mach 6. In a direct confrontation, the Su-57 would have more shots and have a greater reach than the current F-35, although that advantage would be lost once the Lightning II gets the AIM-260 and the MBDA Meteor. So far, things don't seem to be that promising for the F-35. However, to make use of its greater ammunition and range, the Su-57 must first detect its target F-35 before it gets detected itself. As we have seen in the two planes' particular stealth configurations, this might prove difficult for the Russian fighter to do. From what we do know, the F-35 would usually have the advantage of early detection. The F-35 is the world's most sophisticated sensory aircraft. A few aviation experts have likened it to a supercomputer in the sky. The F-35 comes equipped with the ANAPG-81 Active Electronically Scanned Array AESA, radar system. The range of the ANAPG-81 is, as you would expect, a highly guarded secret. 
but some aviation experts think it can spot targets between 250 and 300 miles away. The ANAPG-81 can provide high-resolution ground mapping to the F-35's pilot. The Lightning II also comes equipped with a network of cameras at various points on the plane to give the pilot a 360-degree field of view, with the information being fed directly into the helmet. These capabilities will be increased even further with the coming F-35 Block 4 upgrades. The F-35 sensors also include the Advanced Electro-Optical Targeting System and the custom-made ANASQ-239 Barracuda Electronic Warfare System, developed by BAE Systems. The Barracuda provides both offensive and defensive electronic warfare support, which provides all-aspect broadband protection to suppress enemy radar systems and assist the F-35 in targeting valuable assets. For example, the Barracuda Electronic Warfare Suite can turn the F-35 into a stand-in electronic warfare attack platform without needing to call upon a specialized plane. In this capacity, an F-35 approaching an enemy air defense system could attempt to jam it with its onboard electronic warfare suite. The Barracuda system is also an open architecture one, designed to allow for the addition of new capabilities as they become available. Current F-35s can track 23 enemy planes in 9 seconds and engage 19 in under 3 seconds. The Su-57 also comes equipped with its own AESA radar system, the NO-36 Bielka. This radar provides X and L band modes to make it more resistant to enemy electronic warfare countermeasures. The radar provides a 120-degree field of view in elevation and azimuth, the angle between a reference plane and a point. This is the highest possible number for a flat phase array antenna. Though the radar's range is also naturally a secret, some estimates suggest that the NO-36 Bielka can detect an 11-square-foot target at a range of roughly 250 miles. The radar system is spread across the felon's body. The Su-57 also comes packed with equipment to give it improved situational awareness. This equipment includes cameras interspersed throughout the plane to give the pilot the information. At first glance, the two planes seem roughly comparable in their radars and electronic warfare abilities. But the F-35 should have longer range detection now and a reduced cross-section. In the short future, the F-35's advantage in this area will grow as the Block 4 version of the Lightning II will come with a new radar, the ANAPG-85, produced by Northrop Grumman. While the details are, of course, another secret, the new radar will have an even longer range than its predecessor. It will also have higher resolution, superior tracking, and better electronic warfare capabilities such as jamming and degrading enemy radars. The new radar will have these superior features in part thanks to it being based on a gallium nitride semiconductor system. This same technology is also being designed for the United States Air Force's coming sixth-generation fighter jet, the Next Generation Air Dominance NGAD, program, giving the F-35 some features of a sixth-generation plane. The current F-35 versus the advertised features of the Su-57 should make for a close contest. Both have similar range, although the F-35's radar has a slightly longer range. Their missiles have similar range too, although the Russian R-37 is faster. The coming Block 4 F-35, combined with the AIM-260 Jatam, should give the Lightning II a decided advantage over the Felon at longer distances. The design specifications between the two planes suggest that the F-35 should be able to detect the Felon from further away and shoot it before it can in turn be detected. The F-35 also carries another advantage, sensor fusion, which would prove a significant advantage in any real-world meeting between the two jets. The Su-57 has sensor fusion capabilities of its own. It can link up with Russian assets in the air and on the ground and share its data. However, the F-35's sensor fusion capability is unparalleled. The Lightning II's sensor fusion capabilities can generate real-time pictures of the battlefield and feed it to friendly forces, enabling a combined arms approach to tactical situations through information integration. The Block 4 F-35 will have even greater sensor fusion capabilities. The coming capability will create something that the American military brass calls kill webs, integrating an all-domain approach to target selection and striking. For example, in a scenario involving a meeting between the F-35 and Su-57, 
the former would be able to more easily relay targeting information to a friendly aircraft or a nearby air defense system that might be in a better position to shoot the incoming Russian plane down. In addition to adding to the F-35's network capabilities, the kill web ability will help the Lightning II to maintain its stealth profile, since it would not need to open its weapons bay to shoot down the incoming Russian aircraft. For a plane that already had a stealth advantage, the kill web would greatly add to its ability to detect and shoot down the Su-57 before it detects the F-35. As we've seen in a direct fight between the two planes, a first-look, first-kill ability for the F-35 is its key to victory. The Lightning II is not a plane that was engineered to take part in close-quarters combat like the Su-57. Its purpose is not air superiority, but to be a jack-of-all-trades force multiplier. If the Su-57 can detect its American enemy, it should have the advantage. However, since the Su-57 is more visible to radar than the F-35, in long-range combat scenarios, the Lightning II should be better able to shoot down its Russian rival, particularly once the AIM-260 Jatam becomes available in large numbers. That process is expected to begin in 2024 and will be completed by the end of the decade. The advent of kill webs will add to the F-35's advantages at long range. Perhaps that is no longer a one-on-one -on -one fight, but in any real wartime scenario, both of these planes will serve as one component in a much bigger framework. A real confrontation between these two fighters would not involve a one-on-one -on -one fight, but as part of a network, and this would be where the Su-57 would find itself at its most pronounced disadvantage. The Russian aerospace forces have been hesitant to deploy their newest toy in the skies of Ukraine. For all its capabilities, the Kremlin does not appear to be too confident about the new plane's ability to hide from enemy planes and air defense systems. Most war watchers have observed that the Russian brass is afraid to lose the Su-57 Felon. As we mentioned, only 22 of them are in service as of the end of 2023. Production delays and international sanctions may prevent the Russian military from acquiring the initial batch of 76 that it ordered in 2019. Meanwhile, over 1,000 F-35 Lightning II planes have been built as of January 2024. The United States alone plans to buy a total of 2,457 F-35 aircraft. In any scenario involving hostilities in Eastern Europe, the Su-57 would be significantly outnumbered. The Felon's flaws might go deeper than its production problems. Chris Bolton, an aviation expert, noted on his Twitter feed in June 2022 that the Russian plane has a much larger radar cross-section than commonly reported. According to him, the Su-57 has a radar cross-section similar to the fourth-generation F-A-18 Super Hornet, making it 1,000 times less stealthy than the F-35. Experts have commonly mentioned that the Su-57 is by far the least stealthy of the four fifth-generation aircraft currently in the world's skies, a roster that also includes the F-22 Raptor and China's Chengdu J-20. Such a lack of stealth profile might explain why the Kremlin has been so hesitant to deploy it over Ukraine's battlefields and has so far only used it in a long-range support role from Russian airspace. If this is true, the Su-57 would be at a much more pronounced disadvantage against the F-35 than commonly believed. And it's for this reason why many aviation experts do not consider the Felon a true fifth-generation fighter, but rather an advanced fourth-generation plane. Despite numerous doubts, the Su-57 boasts some impressive features. In a traditional plane-versus-plane -plane fight at visual range, it would likely beat the F-35. The F-35 would also need to be careful about its shot placement, because in a fight with the Su-57 Felon, it would not be able to carry external weapons and expect to survive, because doing so would give up its stealth advantage. However, the F-35 is far more capable to meet the demands of the modern battlefield, and it will only get more capable over the coming years. It is arguable that the Kremlin built a plane to fight the last war. So although it is a capable aircraft, it might not be capable enough to stand up to its true fifth-generation rivals like the F-35. The Kremlin has stated that the current Su-57 will not be the final version, with the Russian brass even claiming that upgrades could make the Felon the first sixth-generation fighter flying the world's skies ahead of even the NGAD. Safe to say, most aviation experts are very skeptical about these claims. In most practical, real-world fights between the two planes, 
It would likely be smarter to put your money on the F-35 under most conditions. But do you agree? Don't forget to let us know in the comments. Also make sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for more military analysis from military experts. When you break down the T-90 on paper, Russia's most modern battle tank looks pretty fierce. Among other high-tech accessories, it boasts a 125mm smoothbore gun, modular composite armor, and a 1,000-plus horsepower V12 diesel engine. In theory, it offers excellent mobility, protection, and firepower, along with the ability to launch armor-piercing, fin-stabilized, discarding sabot rounds, and anti-tank guided missiles. The T-90 also has several variants and has been a popular export due to its relatively high cost-to-benefit ratio. Then why, you might be wondering, has the T-90 been such an epic failure on the battlefield? To be fair, it's not just the T-90s that are dropping like flies. As Russia's war with Ukraine continues, since February last year, the Russian Armored Corps losses have since reached more than 2,100 tanks. That's around two-thirds of the tanks Russia initially rolled out of Moscow on their way to Kyiv. Russia has lost so many tanks, in fact, that they've had to reactivate and deploy hundreds of older models, including the T-72 Ural, T-62, and T-5455, some of which are 50, 60, even 70 years old. And most of these have headed to the front without any meaningful upgrades, not since the collapse of the Soviet Union anyway, to their optics, fire control systems, or armor. It probably wasn't the first choice, one could imagine, of the boys back at the Kremlin to roll out these older models. This decision likely has something to do with the recent spike in losses of their prized T-90s. In total, Russian troops have been forced to scrap or abandon nearly 60 of these 53-ton, three-person tanks, roughly 15% of Russia's pre-war inventory, with most being lost in only the last few months. But wait, aren't these supposed to be the baddest tanks around? That's certainly what the Kremlin's been saying. Before we get to the specific factors contributing to the T-90's proposed survivability, or lack thereof, let's take a moment to address one other important point. When we zoom out, there's an argument to be made that the increasing number of T-90s being destroyed on the battlefield in Ukraine might actually be a negative sign of things to come for our friends in Kyiv. How's that? Well, let's look at it like this. One reason that so many T-90s have been destroyed recently, but certainly not the only reason, is that there's been more of them deployed to destroy. Translation, Russia's current production of T-90s has been picking up, as Putin's nearly two-year effort to boost tank production finally seems to be paying off. Apparently, Russia has been able to work around some of its increasingly tighter foreign sanctions, including those on critical high-end electronics that it was once importing from France. As mentioned before, the number of destroyed or captured T-90s accounts for roughly a quarter of Russia's pre-war inventory. This overall number, however, does not include the hundreds that have been produced by the Ural Vagonzavod plant in Svedlovsk Oblast since the start of 2022. Russia's increased productivity could become a serious problem for Ukraine, considering its main tank plant, the Malyshev factory in Kharkiv, currently lacks the capacity to produce new tanks from scratch and is limited to performing upgrades and repairs. This leaves Ukraine's armored forces mostly reliant on foreign donations if they intend to deploy a fleet of modern Western-style tanks, which they have, including German Leopard 2s, British Challenger 2s, and the American M1 Abrams. But are foreign donations going to be able to match Russian tank production? Well, it's hard to say, but it probably wouldn't hurt for Ukraine's Western allies to throw in a few more tanks, especially because the Ural Vagonzavod plant can, hypothetically, produce enough new T-90s in the next six months to match Ukraine's current inventory of comparable modern battle tanks. But even if this theory is true, and an increasing number of T-90s are being destroyed largely because more are being manufactured and deployed, that certainly isn't the whole story. The overall effectiveness and functionality of the T-90 has been a matter of debate since the beginning, with many distinguished experts expertly concluding that, overall, the T-90 is a piece of junk. First introduced as the T-72BU, then renamed the T-90 to distinguish it from all the other T-72 variants, the T-90 was thought to be one of the most well-protected tanks in the world, while also boasting one of the most heavily equipped battle systems currently on the market. After being officially brought into service in 1992, the T-90 has received a number of upgrades and subsequent name changes. In 2004, it was renamed the T-90A, and then in 2016, 
it was upgraded and rebranded again as the T90M. Then, after its most recent upgrade in 2017, it came to be called the T90MS. There were also less popular variants along the way, but those aren't worth mentioning here. Since its conception, one of the major selling points of the T90 has been its relatively low cost. Save for the most recent variant, the T90MS, which runs closer to $4 million, the full line of older, less expensive T90 models can still be purchased and exported for around $3 million. Even though it continues to be produced primarily for use by the Russian Army's armored division, the Kremlin has sold and exported thousands of T90s, mostly T90S variants, to countries such as Algeria, Armenia, and Iraq. In fact, India alone is now in possession of more than 2,000 Russian-built T90Ss. Underneath the hood, so to speak, of all currently available T90 variants is a V12 diesel engine. The most powerful, coming in at 1,130 horsepower, can be found on the T90MS. The T90 is also about 20 tons lighter than the M1 Abrams, and was designed to accommodate and be operated by, thanks to its auto-loading firing system, just a three-man crew. Upon closer inspection, however, the effectiveness of both the engine and loading system have come into question, but more on that a bit later. So what about firepower? Well, if the T90 has one thing going for it, it definitely has a lot of that. The T90's 2A46M4 125mm smoothbore main gun can fire a range of high-tech ammunition options, including armor-piercing, fin-stabilized discarding sabot rounds, as well as the anti-tank guided missiles mentioned earlier, also known as the 9M119 Reflex, or by NATO as the AT-11 Sniper. These high-tech projectiles have a maximum range of 4,000 meters, with a flight time of 11.7 seconds, and can, under certain conditions, even take down helicopters. Also in terms of firepower, the T-90 features two externally mounted machine guns. One is a 12.7mm cord heavy machine gun that has a cycle rate of fire of 700 to 800 rounds per minute and can be remotely operated from within the tank. The other is a PKMT 7.62mm coaxial machine gun. And when it comes to protection, in addition to conventional armor plating, modern T-90 variants also come equipped with two very high-tech defensive systems. The first is the Shatora-1, an active protection system made by the Russian company Electronic Torg that includes a 360-degree laser warning receiver complete with automatically triggered countermeasures. The deploy of the tank is painted by an enemy laser. This device can even orient the tank's main gun in the direction of the laser's origin. The Shatora-1, among other features, also comes with an infrared jammer and a grenade launching system that has the capacity to discharge smoke grenades which release an infrared obscuring aerosol cloud. The modern T-90's second line of defense is its Contact 5 Explosive Reactive Armor, or ERA, which is essentially a layer of high explosive sandwiched between two metal plates designed to minimize the damage of explosive projectiles by detonating just prior to their impact. Pretty fancy, right? ERA was specifically designed to counter a range of advanced weaponry including missiles and rockets carrying high-explosive anti-tank warheads, as well as highly deadly sabot rounds, which separate after being fired and turn into a thin, fin-stabilized rod made of depleted uranium. Once a sabot round impacts an enemy tank, the kinetic force it creates while penetrating also creates a steam of molten metal that pours into the cabin with it. This instantaneously increases the temperature and pressure inside of the sealed turret, killing or rather cooking everyone inside. The T-90 also comes with a magnetic mine detection system that, when functioning properly, uses an electromagnetic pulse to disable mines before the tank can run over them. So then, what's the deal, you might be asking? Why aren't these extra fancy protection systems making the T-90s unstoppable? For one, these systems haven't performed so well against long-range anti-tank guided missiles. There was one report that stated a Ukrainian took out two T-90Ms back-to-back using an AT-4 anti-tank weapon. If that report is accurate, this would be a very impressive set of skills. The Swedish-made Saab AT-4, given to the Ukrainians by the US and Sweden, is a lightweight, shoulder-launched anti-armor weapon. However, despite delivering an 84mm projectile out to a range of 300 meters, this unguided weapon should not be effective against a T-90M's reactive armor, which the manufacturers claim is effective against not just low-speed rockets and missiles, but also tank rounds coming in at hypersonic speeds. There are, it seems, even more embarrassing ways to lose a tank, 
which Russia has also discovered recently. Apparently, a group of Russian technicians accidentally set fire to a T-72 they were attempting to repair. In the confusion, the ammunition on board caught fire and exploded, completely destroying the tank and damaging two others nearby. The loss of this tank and the two T-90Ms suggest that a more complex set of problems might be plaguing the Russian military. And this makes the actual durability and effectiveness of the T-90 more difficult to determine. Is the hyped T-90M any less vulnerable than earlier models? It's hard to tell when it's regularly being used without proper tactical or common sense. Another reason the T-90 was poorly conceived compared to other main battle tanks is that its underlying design is outdated. Ultimately, as we mentioned before, the T-90 is simply an improved version of the T-72. Essentially, the turret of the T-80 and the hull and drivetrain of the T-72 combined together and covered over with reactive armor. And because the T-90 is in its essence only an update, it retains all of the defects of its bargain-built older brothers. Its inherent shortcomings, leading to the apparent failure of the T-90's ultra-modern defensive systems, is one thing. But this tank has also been the victim of tactical incompetence and has regularly been rolled into impossible, no-win situations. In modern warfare, advancing tanks are supposed to be supported by infantry for the very purpose of suppressing enemy ground troops who might be using anti-tank weapons, like the AT-4. Deployed armor should also have artillery support, if only to help mitigate any long-range threats. Sending tanks forward without defensive support, as Russia has continued to do in Ukraine, makes them extremely vulnerable, especially to infantry units using shoulder-launched weapons. Mobile ground units, when allowed to get in close, can carry out ambushes at short range, which allows them to focus their attacks on a tank's more vulnerable target areas. A particularly vulnerable area for these tanks that's also been exposed by the creative fighting tactics being used in Ukraine is the roof. So it seems the T-90 has had some trouble with the anti-tank missiles that are fired from elevated positions and ultimately come down onto these vehicles from above. The T-90's 360-degree active protection system is supposed to protect from this sort of attack, and its failure to do so might suggest that this fancy new system isn't as infallible as first advertised. A range of other deficiencies came to light after the first T-90 was captured, intact, from the battlefield in Ukraine. With the tank now safely in their possession, military specialists from the Ukrainian Center for the Study of Captured and Prospective Weapons and Military Equipment were able to conduct an analysis of all internal equipment and armaments and went on to publicly announce their findings in March of 2023. When, around the same time, another T-90A was captured, this one was apparently handed over to the US, also for the purpose of research. But when one of Russia's most modern pieces of armor was spotted on a trailer in Louisiana, then subsequently photographed, a debate surrounding the tank's unlikely appearance on American soil exploded on social media. It isn't fully known what the US ultimately had planned for the tank, but we do know what Ukraine did with theirs. They ripped it apart, literally and figuratively. Once the team of Ukrainian experts had completed their investigation, they claimed to have uncovered little more than an old T-72 hiding beneath the shell of widespread Russian propaganda labeling Russia's new war machine an overall failure and not nearly the breakthrough the Kremlin had been all along claiming it to be. The team of engineers from the Center for the Study of Captured and Prospective Weapons and Military Equipment also noted that the well-praised automatic loader was largely the same design as could be found on the older T-72, the only major difference being that the ammo was now stored in a separate compartment outside the turret this modification, however, created the complication of tankers having to fully exit the vehicle in order to load ammunition into the main compartment, which, to be done with any practical sense or relative amount of safety, would require that the tank leave the field of battle. Talk about taking yourself out of the fight. The center also reportedly discovered significant limitations concerning the T-90's B92S2F V12 diesel engine, which Ukrainian engineers claimed did not have sufficient power to reliably propel the vehicle, a claim that was supported by videos of T-90s getting stuck in the mud. They also noted that the highly praised Kalina computerized fire control system had incorporated in its design not only civilian electronic components, but some of Western origin. While other electronic components had been assembled without adhering to moisture control requirements, resulting in increased oxidation, shortened lifespan, and unexpected failure. 
But the embarrassment of Russian tank builders isn't the Kremlin's biggest problem here. If Ukraine persists in revealing the secrets and vulnerabilities of the allegedly advanced systems and technologies of the T-90, this could potentially create a serious financial challenge for Russia in the future. By giving other countries the information needed to produce their own, while simultaneously diminishing the hype surrounding the Russian-made T-90, sales are bound to diminish. And this is no small sum we're talking about. Russia has currently received a combined total of nearly $10 billion for exported T-90s from India and Algeria alone. But a fair amount of damage seems to have already been done. As reports of the T-90s mediocrity have continued to surface, many foreign companies that had previously signed contracts with Russia have swiftly cancelled those agreements. All these technological and mechanical shortcomings, though, are only part of the bigger story. The lack of success the T-90 has had on the battlefield in Ukraine cannot be truly understood without looking at the opposition they faced. It would be a disservice to Ukraine's ferocious troops to do otherwise. Combined with grit and determination born largely of national pride, Ukrainian forces have also received an impressive amount of anti-tank weaponry from the US as well as other allies. From the US alone, Ukraine has received more than 10,000 Javelin anti-armor systems, 90,000 other anti-armor systems and munitions, 8,000 tube-launched, optically-tracked, wire-guided Tau missiles, 35,000 grenade launchers and small arms, 4 million rounds of small arms ammunition and grenades, and a whole slew of laser-guided rocket systems, rocket launchers, and anti-tank mines. According to Washington's regularly updated list of wartime contributions, which includes 31 Abrams tanks, 45 T-72B tanks, 186 Bradley infantry fighting vehicles, 20 Mi-17 helicopters, dozens of combat drones, lots of state-of-the-art satellite communications equipment, and more than 100,000 sets of body armor and helmets, President Biden has provided nearly $44 billion in military assistance to Ukraine thus far. Weapons are a critical part of warfare, that's obvious, but without resourcefulness, they will only take a conventional force so far. Which makes the new tactic Ukrainian forces have been using against Russian tanks that much more impressive. To go along with their already proven yet more traditional ambush maneuvers, they've also developed a highly creative yet simple way of utilizing landmines. Essentially, as a Russian mine plow clears a path through a known minefield, Ukrainian troops will wait for it to pass, then toss fresh mines onto the same path right in front and sometimes behind the trailing convoy, effectively littering the cleared corridor with new mines. The vehicles following the mine plow end up hitting these mines or run over the mines as they try to escape the trap. To execute this brazen new maneuver, the Ukrainians have been utilizing two different types of mines. One is the Soviet TM-62, the other is the American Remote Anti-Armor Mine System, or RAM, of which the US has donated more than 30,000. The 21-pound TM-62 is what you think of when you think of a traditional mine, basically a big metal disc packed with explosives and fitted with some sort of fuse. The RAM, on the other hand, is slightly different and consists of nine mines that are four pounds each stacked together in a hollow 155mm artillery shell. With practice, Ukrainian troops have found that a few well-aimed volleys can scatter scores of these, each with a magnetic fuse, across a relatively wide area. This tactic has been a big success recently, as armored vehicles have continued to roll in neat lines across the fields and forests between the Russian-occupied cities of Pavlivka and Volodar. And what often happens, after the lead tank hits a mine and explodes, the rest of the column attempts to scatter. Some vehicles try to go around the wrecked lead vehicle only to hit a mine themselves. In these scenarios, even retreat is dangerous, as there might be fresh mines now scattered behind the column, littered across the very path it used to come through. In the past weeks, in the region surrounding Volodar, the Russians have lost 30 or more armored vehicles, including a few tanks, and it seems that well-placed mines have largely been the cause. To defeat these tactics and save a few of their prized T-90s, Russia will need, at minimum, better intelligence and a more flexible command and control strategy. In theory, the narrow TM-62 minefields shouldn't be that hard to avoid if the opposing force was able to, let's say, organize 24-hour surveillance and a reliable means of disseminating information to its frontline forces. 
and Russia will need exactly that if they want to keep ahead of Ukraine's clearly savvy military engineers. But what do you think? Have the technical shortcomings of the Russian T-90 been the primary cause of its poor performance? Or are these tanks being utilized poorly and judged unfairly? Also, how might foreign military aid and Ukraine's improvised tactics be contributing to the loss of so many Russian tanks? Let us know in the comments. And don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. Imagine that it's the year 2030. NATO forces operating somewhere near the Baltic coastline have come across a truly frightening sight. The Russian forces on the opposite end of no man's land are outfitted in body armor, which makes them look like a unit of robocops. Their faces are covered with an intimidating helmet and visor that gives them an edge in the information domain. Their chests and all of their extremities are protected by overlapping bullet-resistant plates. To make matters worse, their armor also has an integrated exoskeleton that increases their strength, speed, and endurance. The protective power of their armor is also unparalleled. Even 50 caliber Browning machine gun rounds don't have enough stopping power to put these guys down. What's a NATO unit to do in the face of such fearsome enemies? Well, not much, because this scenario is likely to be as imaginary as anything that Hollywood can produce. Meet the Sotnik, Russia's next-generation body armor that worried defense officials and military experts when it was unveiled. If it works as advertised, there is reason indeed to be worried, but it probably won't. And there is a long history of Russian body armor failures to believe that it won't. Before Russia invaded Ukraine, defense and foreign policy analysts regarded its military as the second most capable fighting force in the world. It had demonstrated its post-Soviet prowess with experience in Chechnya in the 1990s and 2000s, Georgia in 2008, and Ukraine in 2014, when it rapidly secured control of Crimea. It was also a fearsome military. Experts remembered the devastation the Russian Air Force and artillery units had brought to the Chechen city of Grozny during multiple battles in the 1990s. Aside from the Kremlin building a formidable artillery-based land force that would be resilient against air attacks, experts also touted Russia's new, technologically advanced weapon systems. These platforms included the new fifth-generation Su-57 fighter jet and the T-14 Armata main battle tank, which was supposedly more advanced than any other tank in foreign arsenals. However, when Russia launched the invasion, these theories quickly got tossed to the winds. The supposedly fearsome Russian war machine proved hard-pressed to supply itself over even short distances. The T-14 and Su-57 were almost nowhere to be seen, and Russian soldiers found themselves bogged down in a costly war of attrition, suffering from poor command doctrine and Western weapons like the Javelin and HIMARS, which proved so devastating to their supposedly latest and greatest gear. Even the venerable Patriot air defense system, which first came online in the 1980s, was able to knock one of Russia's ultra-modern Kinzhal hypersonic missiles, which Vladimir Putin had once touted as invincible, out of the sky. Now the Russian military is boasting about its next-generation body armor, the Sotnik. If it delivers as promised, it will protect its wearer better than any other body armor system in the world, but like most Russian boasting, there's a lot of hype about the Sotnik, and not a whole lot of facts. Since 2016, Russian troops have worn the Ratnik 2 body armor system, accompanied by the 6B45 helmet. The Ratnik's vest has an effective area protection that is larger than most other body-comparable armor systems. Based on a material similar to Kevlar, the Ratnik covers 90% of a soldier's body, and its granite ceramic plates can withstand 10 sniper rifle shots from a distance of only 10 meters. It is a good system to protect against shrapnel and explosive fragments too. The Ratnik's overalls protect the entire body from these flying pieces of metal and other debris. Ratnik 2 takes care to protect the groin and extremities like the hands. The 6B45 helmet, meanwhile, covers an area of 30 square decimeters with effective protection. Despite this, the helmet remains light at only 1 kilogram, which means that Russian military personnel can attach various instruments to it without adding undue strain on their necks. Such equipment includes thermal and night vision monoculars, flashlights, and a communication system with specialized headphones. Perhaps most impressively, the Ratnik 2 body armor has an electromagnetic camouflage system that shields its wearer from infrared sensors. The armor weighs between 40 and 50 pounds, but some of the weight is relieved by a passive carbon fiber exoskeleton. The exoskeleton also protects its wearer's spine and joints from the gradual wear and tear 
that lugging around such heavy weight will do to a person over time. This exoskeleton does not need an external power source to function. Ratnik is supposed to be getting an upgrade too. In 2020, Russia announced it would be developing its Ratnik 3 body armor system. This version would include an integrated exoskeleton, a helmet visor-mounted target designation system, stealth fabric, anti-mine boots, a vision system via electric goggles that would allow soldiers to link up with the camera views of small drones and see tactical orders or maps of the broader area, and an anti-thermal and anti-radar camouflage suit. The integrated exoskeleton for the Ratnik 3 was getting an upgrade as well. It was reportedly designed to comfortably haul weights of up to 132 pounds during combat operations. In 2021, American military planners were nervous about these developments. There was the feeling that the United States was lagging behind on body armor and exoskeleton systems for its soldiers and Marines. The revelation of Sotnik made American defense officials and think tanks even more nervous. Now they know better. Unfortunately for Russia, much of the hype about the Ratnik was a bunch of boasts, as we've come to expect by now. In 2017, the Russian army said it had received 200,000 sets of Ratnik 2 body armor. The following year, the Russian Ministry of Defense said it expected that all of its military personnel would be equipped with the Ratnik 2 by 2020. But 2020 came and went, and the Russian military failed in its goal. The invasion of Ukraine proved as such. Instead of getting standard-issue gear, Russian troops fighting in Ukraine, even those in the regular army at the start of the invasion, have had to make do with what body armor they could get. Most of the Ratnik's claims failed to materialize on the battlefield. Complaints about body armor and helmet malfunction have been frequent in the Russian ranks throughout the course of the war. Instead of the new Ratnik, some of the luckier Russian troops have been seen wearing older 6B23 body armor in Ukraine. This armor can be protective against indirect impacts like shrapnel or shell fragments, but lacks the ability to adequately defend its wearer from direct ballistic hits. Even if the enemy gunshots fail to penetrate the 6B23, the armor cannot easily disperse the energy the impacting bullets transfer to the human body. Broken bones and internal trauma were frequently reported among those who wore 6B23 body armor and suffered combat-related injuries. These shortcomings are what prompted the Kremlin to replace the 6B23 with the Ratnik family of armors in the first place. However, complete Ratnik armors were few and far between on the battlefields of Ukraine. What happened? Typical corruption within the Russian military's ranks has proven part of its body armor failures. In 2021, a Russian captain and ensign were convicted of stealing 56 sets of body armor and selling them online. The captain got a sentence of six years and the ensign got seven years. Both of them are currently serving time in a penal colony. These two may have been made an example of, but they were hardly the only ones. It's common for officers in the Russian military to sell off top-of-the-line gear to line their own pockets, and then issue Cold War-era equipment to the soldiers under their command instead. The Russian military's body armor problems got much worse when Vladimir Putin announced partial mobilization in the fall of 2022. As Ukraine was pushing his forces back in Kharkiv and Kherson, and he desperately needed additional manpower. According to defense intelligence officials in the UK, the conscripts Russia mobilized in late 2022 often had no choice but to buy their own body armor because Russian armories were short. Many of the armor kits that these people and their families wound up buying turned out to be fake too. Those lucky enough to get their hands on real Ratnik armor often wound up becoming victims of theft, as poorly equipped Russian regular troops at the front simply stole it from them. The demand led to a boom in the price of any kind of body armor that even looked real on Russian e-commerce sites. Body armor, and we use that term loosely in this context, can now fetch up to $650 a piece online in Russia. This is a price that most of the soldiers in Ukraine and their families cannot afford, especially because a disproportionate amount of the people conscripted to fight in the autumn of 2022 came from Russia's poorer ethnic minority communities. Ukrainian soldiers who have captured body armor worn by Russian soldiers on the battlefield have often found such gear fitted with cheap steel plates instead of the high-tech ceramics, which are now designed to slow the bullet down to reduce its impacting force. The ceramic plates in high-quality body armor like the American Interceptor also fracture and deform the bullet itself as it impacts the vest. This fracturing and deforming in turn distributes the bullet's energy over a wider area to protect the wearer against blunt force trauma. While some armies use steel instead of ceramics in their body armor, 
This steel is extremely tensile and specially manufactured to stand up to small arms ballistics. The captured steel plates in Ukraine, though, have proven little match for small arms fire. Standard 9mm parabellum rounds were shown to puncture the steel plates on videos posted to social media by Ukrainian soldiers. Rifle rounds easily did the job. They are little more than steel sheets stolen from somewhere else and fitted into what was supposed to be body armor. Captured Russian body armor also seemed to be little more than a cloth covering to hold the faulty steel plates in place. This is in contrast to Western body armor, which is made from Kevlar and other fabrics engineered to be resistant to small arms fire and shrapnel or explosive fragments. The Russian armor, meanwhile, seemed like it would only be good against fragments or shrapnel in the area that the plates directly covered. Indeed, Ukrainian troops have been seen on video bending the steel plates in captured Russian body armor with their hands, feet, and over their knees. They laugh contemptuously as they do so. This equipment is probably not official Ratnik armor, but rather knockoffs sold on Russian e-commerce sites. However, one Russian conscript even complained on video that he was given a vest that would only be effective against an airsoft gun. It turns out that the Russian logistics brass opted to buy the toy replicas of Ratnik armor for their mobilized soldiers and pocketed the rest of the money allocated to them. Even if Russian soldiers or conscripts are lucky enough to get their hands on legitimate Ratnik armor, it is often not a complete kit. Corruption is so widespread in the Russian military that the ceramic plates inside the Ratnik vests are often missing, either to cut costs or because they are valuable commodities to sell off in their own right. Corrupt Russian logistics officers instead sold off the ceramics and replaced them with the cheap, non-ballistic steel plates that Ukrainian soldiers made fun of in the videos. The lack of effective body armor in Ukraine has proven devastating for the Russian war effort. At the end of August 2023, the Pentagon released estimates which painted a grim picture for the Russians. According to the US military, total Russian casualties over the 18-month war were approaching the 300,000 mark. This total included about 120,000 dead and 170 to 180,000 combat-related injuries. Ukraine, meanwhile, was suffering too, with 70,000 KIA and between 100 and 120,000 wounded. However, the Russians outnumber the Ukrainians by nearly 3 to 1 on the battlefields of Ukraine. There are many reasons for this disparity in casualties despite Russia's manpower advantage, but the lack of proper body armor is a big one. The Russian body armor industry is in such a poor state that the military is now turning to Chinese equipment to make up for its shortcomings. China has been reluctant to provide military aid to Russia for fear of Western sanctions, but some Chinese firms have been supplying their beleaguered strategic partner with weapons and equipment through backdoor means. Such aid includes body armor. 12 tons worth of Chinese body armor were routed to Russia through Turkey in late 2022. The body armor came from companies such as Xingxing Guangzhou Import and Export Company. Chinese companies have also sent component parts to Russian body armor manufacturers like Klass, although it's not currently understood how widespread the Klass vests have been used in Ukraine. Ukrainian soldiers have captured Klass vests on the battlefield too, although it's also unclear if these contain Chinese component parts. Ukrainian troops have been known to sell these captured materials online. Chinese body armor has been tested by American defense officials. This type of body armor uses aramid fibers, which are the same kind of fibers found in the familiar Kevlar vests used in the United States and other Western militaries. In the tests, the Chinese body armor's ceramic plates succeeded in stopping standard small arms fire, such as the 7.62mm round, from penetrating. However, the plates showed significant deformation. The deformation indicates that soldiers wearing this armor would suffer from blunt force trauma if struck by enemy fire because the energy would not be dispersed over a wide enough area. If Russian troops are looking to this equipment to save them, they will probably wind up being disappointed. So as with many other aspects of its military, Russian body armor looks great on parade grounds and in the Kremlin's information networks. On the battlefield, not so much, and the results in Ukraine show it. For Russia, Anything that can go wrong does seem to go wrong, thanks to institutional incompetence on every conceivable level. Now Russia has plans for its next generation body armor, the Sotnik system, which the Kremlin says will come online in 2025, replacing the Ratnik family of armors. The armor was unveiled in early 2021, about a year before the invasion of Ukraine. 
the armor developed by Russia's state Rostec Corporation would be the most advanced and protective body armor in the world, if it works as advertised. But what have we come to learn about Russia's military's claims by now? According to Rostec, the Sotnik armor would be capable of protecting its wearer against small arms fire and even a direct hit from the 50 caliber Browning machine gun round, which can pierce lightly armored vehicles at a range of 2 kilometers. To protect against the shock of incoming rounds like the .50 BMG, which can transfer more than enough energy to kill, even if the bullet does not penetrate the body, the Sotnik armor will be made from ultra-high molecular weight polythene fibers. These fibers will be designed to not restrict a soldier's movement, even with the added protection. This principle works in theory because polythene is a plastic and plastic is light. But this raises a question, how can a plastic protect you against gunfire, let alone a 50 caliber round? As you would expect, plastics melt at high enough temperatures, including the heat a bullet makes as it transfers its energy to a target. The melting fibers adhere to the bullet and slow it down allowing the other parts of the armor to stop it from penetrating and transfer its energy over a broader area. Because of its heavy use of plastics, the total weight of a set of Sotnik armor will supposedly be reduced by 20 pounds from the Ratnik family of armors. All in all, a set of Sotnik body armor will weigh around 44 pounds, according to Rostec. And as if all the cutting-edge technology wasn't enough, Rostec says it will develop an active titanium exoskeleton to integrate with the armor in the future. Rostec is researching power sources for how this feature would work. As early as 2021, however, there were some military and engineering experts who were skeptical about Russian claims. Since ancient times, armor has always been a compromise between protection and mobility. Too much protection leaves a wearer immobile. It's why some units from then to now chose not to wear any body armor at all. For them, mobility was their best protection. Other units preferred to fight with heavier armor because they did not expect to need a lot of mobility. The latest question in this age-old compromise is, can polythene armor capable of stopping a 50 caliber machine gun round be made lightweight enough for a soldier to actually be able to wear it and not be immobile? According to a 2021 analysis in Popular Mechanics, the answer was not promising. For comparison, a standard 7.62mm bullet transfers 1,878 pounds of force on its target. A 50 caliber Browning machine gun round is over four times that, at 11,070. To put that into perspective, this weight would be the same as if a 5-ton truck were sitting on your chest. American military gear can stop standard rifle rounds like 7.62mm, with a total weight on the soldier at 22.6 pounds. This is a good compromise between protection and mobility. Stopping a 50 caliber round is a whole different story, however. That would take 1.25 inches of AR-500 grade steel plate, but this type of steel is far too heavy to comfortably wear. It would make a modern soldier the equivalent of a caricatured version of a medieval knight wearing armor that was too heavy to move around in. The amount of polythene plastic that would be needed to stop a 50 caliber round, even accounting for greater efficiency, would almost certainly be impossible to wear on the battlefield and remain mobile. Popular Mechanics mentioned that Russia could try to compensate for this reality by adding titanium plating to the ensemble of a far more realistic amount of polythene. Since titanium is lighter and stronger than steel, the idea seems feasible. There is also precedent for it. Armorers in the Soviet Union made body armor with titanium components during the Cold War. However, even with this modification, stopping a 50 caliber round and leaving a soldier mobile enough to move around would be very difficult. The verdict about the idea of body armor reliably stopping 50 caliber rounds? Feasible, but don't put your money on it. It's also worth mentioning that 50 caliber machine gun rounds can easily punch holes in cinder block walls. Even if the body armor does stop penetration, dispersing over 11,000 pounds of force safely around the human body would be difficult. The blunt force trauma from the impact of a 50 caliber round would still likely be enough to kill. So even if the logistics to outfit all of Russia's soldiers with Sotnik body armor by 2025 work out, and there is every reason, as we've seen by now, to believe that they won't, the Sotnik still has a long way to go to prove the Kremlin's claims. If we have not learned to doubt those by now, we have not learned anything from the 18-month war in Ukraine. But what do you think about Russia's next generation Sotnik body armor? Does it even have a chance of living up to the claims the Kremlin makes of it? Let us know in the comments. Also, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe 
For more military analysis from military experts. This is Russia's next generation tank, the T 14 Armata, the latest tank from a country that has long prided itself on its armored assets. The T 14 is supposed to be armed with all the latest modern weapons, gadgets, and protective armor, in an ensemble meant to be a clear break from Soviet era tank conventions which stretch back to World War II's revered T 34. Russia sells the T-14 as being in a league of its own, with capabilities that exceed all tanks of foreign manufacture. Indeed, the tank and the chatter around it gave Western observers the chills for a while. However, this facade is probably not all it's cracked up to be. Here's why Russia's next-generation T-14 Armata sucks when it actually comes to winning wars. Work on the project began in 2010 under the label Object 195. The first basic model of the new tank was introduced in July 2012. The Kremlin publicly unveiled this model as the T-14 Armata at a Victory Day parade in 2015, and the tank is supposed to enter full service by 2024. The Armata has, however, suffered multiple delays throughout its brief history. Thus far, only a single T-14 has been spotted in Ukraine. The sighting came in the village of Mijinskaya in Luhansk Oblast on October the 8th. The unit may have been placed there to serve as a command tank for other Russian armored assets. The Russians may also be deploying the T-14 tank as a psychological operation to increase morale on their own side after having experienced embarrassing defeats and to send a message to the Ukrainians that they have yet to best their top-line gear. But how top-line is the Armata really? Would it really make a difference in Ukraine and change Russia's ebbing fortunes if it were deployed in greater numbers? On the surface, the T-14 possesses formidable attributes. It has frontal base armor protection of over 900 mm in combination with Malachit Explosive Reactive Armor and the Afghani Active Protection System. If its armor system works as advertised, the T-14 should be able to take hits from any known tank munition, and with Ukraine's lack of advanced tanks, this could prove a problem should the Armata get deployed in large numbers. The T-14's armor is also supposedly resistant against handheld anti-tank weapons like the famous Javelin, which the Ukrainians have used to great effect against Russian armor in the war. The T-14 also boasts a separate, self-contained crew capsule that is isolated from its magazine and specifically designed to protect the three-man operating team from anti-tank fire, maximizing its defensiveness and aiding its ability to act as a command unit. Other shielding mechanisms include active defense systems at the front of the vehicle to shoot down common anti-tank weaponry, such as RPGs. The tank also reportedly has stealth features, with its armor having a lower radar cross-section than other tanks in use. But that's not all. The Armata is a quick and maneuverable tank, with a top speed of 75 to 80 km per hour in both forward and reverse modes. In contrast, most of Russia's widely used tanks can only achieve a top speed of 4 km per hour while in reverse, making them easy to target with anti-tank fire. The T-14 has a remote-controlled turret that loads automatically with a 45-round magazine. The standard gun is a 125mm 2A82-1M smoothbore, but it can be upgraded to a 2A83 152mm gun. Either type can also fire laser-guided missiles. The T-14's secondary weapons include the Cord 12.7mm machine gun or PKTM 7.62mm machine gun. The Armata's engagement range exceeds any Western tank, as it can hit targets up to 12 kilometers away. Sounds incredible, right? Here's the thing, though. All of these defensive and offensive features sound impressive, but Russia has proven that it isn't exactly a trustworthy source of information about its own capabilities. In reality, the T-14 has shown itself to be lacking so far, and not all is as it seems. The tank's problems stretch back to its debut, when one of them broke down and had to be towed away for repairs during a rehearsal for a military parade in Red Square in 2015, which would have been one of its first public showings. This proved only the first of many embarrassments. Often those shortcomings included not being able to pay for or manufacture the tank at scale. An impressive weapon means little if you cannot produce it in the numbers needed to shift the balance of power on the battlefield. The only one T-14 has been spotted in Ukraine after nine months of war suggests a few problems for the Russians in actually using the tank. The T-14 has been plagued by numerous delays since its public debut in 2015. The Kremlin's initial plans to field 2,300 Armata tanks proved unaffordable and Russia needed to settle for a much smaller total. The Russian armed forces expected the first batch of nine in 2018, but the Kremlin moved the 
date back first to 2019 and then 2020. A 2020 report in The Diplomat stated that 132 armatas would be delivered by 2022, but that has not happened either. It turns out that the company that manufactures the tank, Oral Vagonzavod, also had its fair share of problems. The company is 87 billion rubles in debt and needed to cut the pay of its workforce by 21% between 2019 and 2020. These financial problems may be a reason why only 20 finished T-14s exist as of 2021. The Armata's frequent glitches and production delays came before the hefty sanctions the international community levied in retaliation for Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Such sanctions will make it even more difficult for Russia to obtain the materials it will need to manufacture the T-14's advanced electronics, among other systems. The T-14 may have all the high-tech features that Russia claims it has, but even if all of it was true and it all worked, it means little if the Russians cannot deploy them on the battlefield. The next-generation tank also means little if it's too expensive and becomes a white elephant, which may be the reason why Russia has been hesitant to use the T-14 in Ukraine until now. The Ukrainians have proven excellent tank killers and capturers in this war. The prospect of the T-14 falling into enemy hands must make the Kremlin take pause, and if you're too scared of losing a weapon system to deploy it, it's not exactly a useful tool. Indeed, because Russia has been unable or unwilling to produce the T-14 Armata at scale, it has instead used its resources to upgrade its older arsenal of tanks, such as the T-72, T-80, and T-90A. There are other problems for the T-14 tank as well, ones which go beyond cost, manufacturing, and delivery. One of the reasons for the delays includes continual glitches in the T-14 software. These glitches came partly because of sanctions that the West imposed on Russia following its annexation of Crimea in 2014. Particularly, a major weakness inherent in the Armata is that its much-vaunted protective crew capsule cannot revolve like the gun turret can. The engineering arrangement means that the tank relies on optical systems and electronics to deliver visual information to the crew. That is not exactly ideal when you can't get your software right, and even if it were to check out, how would the crew react to their electronics being taken out during a battle? Speaking of systems failure, some American Abrams crews who are familiar with the T-14 were not impressed with what they saw. They questioned the emphasis of its supposedly modern auto-loading cannon. When speaking in a 2018 report for Business Insider, they asked what would happen if something goes wrong in the middle of a battle and the automated loader stopped working. How much work would it take to get the breach open and get down in there? Since the self-isolated crew capsule is separate from the turret, the answer is it could take a lot of work. As the United States has seen with the F-35s and other expensive modern systems, sometimes Sometimes having the most cutting-edge technology means you sign up for a lot more things potentially going wrong, and if anything is true on a battlefield, many things will go wrong. No plan survives the first contact with the enemy. Even if the T-14's auto-loading system works perfectly, it faces another disadvantage. It is slow. Auto-loading may sound modern, but an American Abrams crew with a human loader can actually get shots off faster. They can usually fire their weapons in five-second intervals at the maximum and more often than not under four. According to Sergeant Emmett Fulgham, a tank gunner with 3rd Battalion 8th Cavalry Regiment who talked about the subject to the military publication Coffee or Die. In contrast, the T-14's auto-loader takes 10 seconds or more to load and fire, meaning that its prospective Western opponents can get two or three shots off for every one that the Armata gets. The Armata may have a longer range, but with such limited numbers and large load times, it may simply not be able to put enough fire down range to tilt the scale of a battle, especially when there will not be many Armatas to begin with. The Armata has supposedly seen limited action in the field, and results have not been encouraging. According to the reports in Chinese media, the T-14 underperformed in its subdued use in Syria. Chinese media blasted the Russians for promoting false combat conditions under which the tank took part, claiming there was no evidence for anything that they were saying. With such praise from his friends, Vladimir Putin must be wondering what his enemies think. For their part, rebel factions in Syria commented that they had not encountered the Russians' newest tank. Other information out of Syria suggests that the Armata's vaunted system of protection didn't work so well. Reporting from 2020 indicated that soldiers wielding anti-tank weapons hit three T-14s, with one of them being completely destroyed. If such reports are true, it is feasible that the Armata's defenses do not live up to the Kremlin's hype, and that advanced anti-tank systems like the American Javelin, British Enlor, and Swedish AT-4 could destroy it, even if the crew in their isolated capsule compartment manages to survive the impact to the tank's turret and magazine. Perhaps this is the reason that only one Armata has been definitively spotted in Ukraine. Another problem that the T-14 faces is that foreign countries, even ones Russia has long had arms deals with like China, India, and Middle Eastern nations, don't seem eager to buy it. Russia has tried to sell the T-14 abroad, but it has found no buyers. The lack of foreign interest leaves Russia even more cash-strapped in developing it, since weapon R&D is expensive and foreign investments help to make the final product pay for itself. For example, robust foreign purchases of the F-35 Lightning II helped the United States share the burden in developing that infamously expensive platform. 
However, with the seeming lack of interest for Russia to buy one of its own assets and its design problems, other countries don't seem too keen on purchasing the Armata. China even claims that its next-generation VT-4 tank is superior to the Armata. The T-14 Armata's problems are large enough to make the Kremlin reconsider its investment in it. Another tank design, which reportedly lost out to the Armata in the 2000s called the Burlak, is now the subject of discussion in the Russian military. This tank is less revolutionary, instead it evolves on Russia's older tank technology to produce a vehicle nearly as good as the Armata. Whether the Burlak re-emerges and spells the doom of the T-14 project remains to be seen, but one thing is certain, the T-14 shows us that appearances can be deceiving and that most modern does not always mean most useful. But what do you think? Does the T-14 Armata have the potential to become the world's greatest tank? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. Why is Putin afraid to deploy the Su-57 to Ukraine? Maybe because much like its land-based counterpart, the T-14 Armata, it's one of the most oversold and disappointing assets within the Russian military. Then there's the fact that Ukraine has been successfully shooting down so many Russian jets that Putin is terrified of his shiny new toy being captured and having its true RCS revealed by the West, as well as the release of any other advanced capabilities, or lack thereof. Let's dive in. When it comes to recent Russian military equipment, there are two things to remember. First, don't believe the hype. And second, make sure your accountant checks the numbers. One of the most overhyped and underwhelming members of the new Russian military is the Su-57 fighter, codenamed Felon by NATO. That codename may be its coolest feature. It promises a lot but delivers much less. What's even more surprising is the way that Russia has been shielding this aircraft from potential risk in the skies near Ukraine. We say near since there's no evidence yet that Russia has risked flying the aircraft anywhere but within Russian airspace, except for a very few brief appearances over much less dangerous Syrian airspace. During those brief deployments in 2018, the Su-57 was still considered a prototype and was described by aviation expert and author Tom Cooper as burdened with inadequate and incomplete sensors, incomplete fire control systems, and self-protection suites, no operational integrated avionics, and unreliable engines. Despite its clean lines, impressive maneuverability, and eye-catching paint schemes, this aircraft falls short in many vital areas, including less than stellar stealth capabilities, its use of outdated engines, a reliance on less than state-of-the-art computer systems, and extremely limited production numbers. Much like the more capable US-made F-22 Raptor and F-35 Lightning stealth fighters, the Su-57 ran into extensive development delays and cost overruns. But unlike the F-22 and F-35, the final aircraft has not lived up to pre-production hype. Actually, we can go as far as to say the Su-57 isn't even comparable to the F-22 and F-35. Here's why. The design and layout of the Sukhoi Su-57 Felon is an evolution of the previous Soviet Union's Su-27 shape, adapted for the requirements of low visibility and supersonic speed and agility. In many Western circles, the Su-57 has been described as a stealth flanker, the flanker being the NATO designation for the Su-27. Both planes are twin-engine, twin-tailed planes, with an emphasis on being multi-role aircraft, meaning they can handle both air superiority roles as well as being able to strike ground targets with onboard munitions. The Su-57 began development in the early 2000s and has been delayed several times. Its original prototype was expected to make its maiden flight back in the year 2007, but numerous problems with its design have caused equally numerous delays. While its engines are essentially the same as those of the aircraft it's designed to replace, the Su-35S, their implementation has not gone well. At first, the Russians refused to acknowledge that their new jet had a development problem. Finally, in late 2009, the Russians admitted that problems with the engine were causing the delays. The original concept for the Su-57 was for the plane to use the newly designed and more powerful Izdelai 30 engines. However, nearly all the prototypes and production models released so far are equipped with the same engine used on the existing Su-35S, the AL-41 engine. The reason the Izdalai 30 engines haven't been used yet is due to reliability and quality control issues, which have yet to be ironed out. Beyond those problems, both the AL-41 and the Izdalai 30 are nothing more than a slightly updated and heavier version of the AL-31 engine, which was designed back in the 1970s. 
that the Su-57, designed to be the best frontline fighter for the latter half of the 2020s, flying with what are effectively 50-year-old engine designs, is just one of the plane's troubles. The other problem that carries over from the earlier AL-31 engine is its propensity for catching fire. The Russian plane that sported the majority of these engines, the MiG-31, has a history of crashes due to engine fires, and the AL-41 used in the Su-57 seems to have inherited that engine fire gene. The very first serial production example, Su-57, crashed in 2019, due to what Russian state-run media outlet RIA Novosti said was a mishap occurred during an engine test, or a potential failure in the Su-57's engine control system, but Russian news agency TASS reported that it was a flight control system error. This possible engine fire followed one of the Type's T-50 prototypes that was badly damaged due to an engine fire in 2014. These engine problems, along with unanticipated structural fatigue in the fuselage and wings, caused a redesign that included more carbon fiber material, a reinforced airframe, and an enhanced wingspan. These additions raised the overall weight of the Su-57 to more than 25 tons, which further reduced its performance on its older engine models and led to additional crashes during testing. These changes and additions delayed the expected first delivery model from 2015 all the way to 2020. The Su-57 was expected to be Russia's entry into what's known as a fifth-generation fighter. These types of planes, including the earlier US-made F-117, more of a stealth testbed than an actual fifth-gen fighter, and the much more advanced F-22 Raptor, introduced several new concepts into the aviation industry. These new benchmarks included advanced stealth, or in the case of the Su-57, stealthier, airframes with reduced radar cross-section RCS, Active Electronically Scanned Array AESA, radar, a type of phased array antenna, and supercruise capabilities, which means a fighter can fly above Mach 1 without using afterburners. In comparison, the US-made F-22 is able to cruise at speeds of Mach 1.5 or greater without the use of afterburners for extended periods in combat configuration. The Su-57 does hit most of the 5th gen benchmarks reasonably well. However, it's in the realm of stealth capability that the Su-57 has been heavily criticized. It certainly falls far short of its US counterparts when compared against the F-22 and F-35. Russian aviation expert Pyotr Batowski points out in his book Russia's Warplanes Volume 1 that the primary means of reducing radar visibility is to carry normally wing or belly-mounted munitions in the interior of the plane. External weapons and extra fuel tanks, along with the racks with which they are attached to the plane, dramatically increase the radar cross-section of a plane. Mounting those internally removes those obstructions, but the improvement comes at a cost. For one, it means the plane can carry fewer of these add-ons, while it also means the airframe must be bigger and wider, which leads to an increased weight, which requires a more powerful engine, or in the Su-57's case, dual engines. That double-engine design also means the plane is more susceptible to infrared heat-seeking missiles. It also means the external exhaust nozzles increase the radar cross-section on their own. That problem can be countered by embedding the exhaust within the body of the airframe, which both the F-22 and F-35 do remarkably well, but the Su-57 doesn't even try to hide its dual exhausts, making it more observable to enemy detection. There's also the need to deal with the straight lines for the engine intakes, as well as the turbine blades just inside those air ducts. Again, the F-22 and F-35 have been designed not just with embedded fan blades, making them almost undetectable by enemy radar, but the intakes are also covered in radar-absorbent material. The Su-57 employs radar blockers to reduce reflections from the engine inlet guide vanes and are installed in the engine air intake ducts, but they don't do enough to remove that radar return. The shape of the airframe has been designed to reduce the number of directions in which electromagnetic waves are reflected, including blending the wings into the airframe's body, which helps increase the plane's stealthiness. But there are other problems with the plane that add to its lack of stealthiness. One glaring problem is that the entire plane isn't coated in radar-absorbent materials, which the F-22 and F-35 have. The Su-57 does have a paint job that many warplane simulation enthusiasts think is really awesome and super cool looking, but it does nothing to hide the plane from enemy radar. What's even worse is that the Su-57 has exposed rivets all across the plane, especially on its wings. Those dramatically increase the plane's radar signature, making the plane stand out in real combat. 
The Russian-leaning website militarywatchmagazine.com, always quick to criticize Western military technology while simultaneously lauding Russian ones, claims the Su-57 is built with a unique blend of low-reflectivity fiberglass, which was offered as a beneficial alternative to the more radar-absorbent stealth coatings used on US and Chinese stealth aircraft, due to its much lower maintenance needs. But the number of problems with this type of an airframe, as seen in the efforts to strengthen and improve the plane after it was supposed to be ready for combat trials, shows that this method of construction presents its own inherent weaknesses. The plane's manufacturer Sukhoi claims the Su-57 has an optimal radar cross-section between 0.1 to 1 square meters. For comparison, the F-117 had a radar cross-section of around 0.003, about one-third as much as an ordinary bird, while the F-35 has an RCS of 0.005 and the F-22 has an RCS of 0.001, which is somewhere around 1,000 to 10,000 times smaller than the Su-57's RCS. In comparison, a B-52 bomber has a radar cross-section rating of 100, an Su-27 has a rating of 15, an F-16, flying clean, meaning without external weapons and fuel tanks, has a 5, a MiG-21 has a 3, an F-16C has a 1.2, an F-A-18 has a 1.0, and the SR-71 Blackbird has a 0.01, which is about the same as an average bird. The F-35's radar cross-section has been compared to a hummingbird, while the F-22's cross-section has been compared to that of a bumblebee. To understand the real-world difference, Russia's standard surface-to-air system, the S-400, uses a 91N6E search radar, which has a detection range of about 240 miles against a target of 4 square meters. If it's operating under optimal conditions, it should be able to detect an F-15 at 325 miles, an F-A-18E Super Hornet around 1 square meter RCS, at 170 miles, the Su-57, assuming 0.1 square meter RCS, at 96 miles, and an F-22 or an F-35, with an RCS of 0.005 or less, at only around 17 miles. In short, a radar would have between 6 to 10 times greater detection range against the Su-57 compared to an F-22 or an F-35. Russia's problem is that many Western analysts don't believe that the 0.1 RCS that the plane's manufacturer Shukhoi claims to have is accurate. If it's found to be closer to 1 or even higher, then its capabilities as a stealth fighter dramatically decrease, which means bad things for Russia's ability to sell the plane overseas to its usual markets like India and China. All of this leads to the question, if the Russians are so positive the Su-57 is the equal, of the F-22 and is the best aircraft Russia has ever built, why are they so reluctant to use it in the current invasion of Ukraine? It's been a glaring issue for the Russian military that they haven't yet established air control over the Ukrainian battlefield, something that their much larger air force was intent on demonstrating from the earliest days of the fighting. The answer is a simple one, though with complicated ramifications. Russia doesn't want to fly one of its very limited number of state-of-the-art aircraft for fear of having it shot down. The risk of having the Su-57 captured and thereby having its true RCS revealed by the West, as well as the release of any other advanced capabilities or lack thereof, is one reason why Russia has been so reluctant to deploy the plane over Ukrainian territory. For a country that has a much smaller and more outdated air force, Ukraine has done a remarkable job of shooting down Russian aircraft and helicopters. As of March 2023, Ukraine had shot down 70 Russian fighter aircraft at the loss of only 60 of their own. And that's not including one disastrous day for Russia, when on May 15, 2023, they lost two fighter jets, an Su-34 and an Su-35, plus two Mi-8 helicopters, all within 12 hours, and all within the Russian territory of Bryansk. The fact that Russia lost multiple downed aircraft within Russian territory, all at the same time, was a stunning blow to their air force. Some Western analysts believe Ukrainian air defense systems might have been pushed closer to the border with Russia to engage aircraft that direct their attacks from within Russian borders. The Russian Air Force has recently begun using more glide munitions, which are bombs with pop-out fins that can strike targets at a greater distance. Ukrainian Air Force spokesman Yuri Enat explained after the May 15th incidents that Russian airplanes regularly attack Ukraine from Russian territory. He said their strike air group attacked Ukraine from the north, from Bryansk Oblast. They do this almost every day. They carry out strikes with guided bombs. Another black day for Russian military aviation was June 24, 2023, 
the day of the abortive rebellion by Yevgeny Prigozhin's Wagner mercenary group. In less than 24 hours, Prigozhin's men managed to shoot down seven combat helicopters, as well as one of Russia's most valuable air assets, an IL-22M airborne command post. It is believed that all of the pilots and personnel on board the eight aircraft were lost. The fact that all of these planes were within Russian airspace shows just how dangerous the invasion against Ukraine has been for the Russian Air Force. The open-source combat tracker Oryx says that the Russian aircraft losses are even higher, confirming that they've lost, at a minimum, 77 fixed-wing aircraft as of July 14, 2023, with another 90 helicopters lost. Oryx's numbers are based only on confirmed losses, so the total number of Russian airplanes lost is almost certainly even higher. Another of the major problems with the Su-57 is that there just aren't very many of them available for the Russian Air Force. The West's best estimates are that Russia has only received somewhere between 5 and 15 of the aircraft, with most analysts suggesting Russia is currently flying a total of only 12 felons. Even TASS, the Russian news agency, says a best-case scenario would see Russia possibly receiving as many as 76 Su-57s, but only by the end of 2028. And that's assuming a big ramp-up of production that Russia's economy doesn't appear likely to meet. These numbers pale in comparison to the number of F-22 Raptors that the US currently has flying, which includes 142 combat aircraft and another 44 used for training and testing new equipment and upgrades. Even more impressive is the number of F-35 Lightnings currently flying. The US alone is operating more than 450 F-35s in its three configurations, the original A version, the vertical short takeoff and landing, VSTOL B version, and the carrier C version. But the F-35's true advantage is the ability to sell these aircraft to America's allies. When you include those countries, there are currently more than 850 F-35s in service around the world, and the US is producing another 156 more of these planes every year. One of the problems that Russia has had in producing the Su-57 has been a lack of overseas partners. One of its original allies in this program was going to be India, who had agreed with Russia back in 2016 to create an improved Su-57 that would have been called the Fifth Generation Fighter Aircraft Program, or FGFA. But years of delays and concerns that the FGFA would not meet project goals led India to put the program on indefinite hold in 2018. India complained that the base Su-57 was too expensive, poorly engineered, and powered by old and unreliable engines. The degree with which India was unhappy with the Su-57 is borne out by the fact that India willingly walked away from the project after already dropping $295 million into pre-development costs, money they'll never get back. With India's departure from the program, Russia lost the largest potential buyer of any future Su-57 aircraft, which meant that Russia will have to bear the cost of developing and producing the aircraft alone. Another potential buyer, Algeria, has a contract to acquire Su-57s in 2025, but that deal may also fall through because Russian firms will not risk having them flight tested on site in Algeria. And Algeria doesn't trust Russia, to be honest, about any tests done in Russian airspace. Instead of working with Russia for its next aircraft, India has announced an agreement to buy the fourth-gen Rafale fighter from France and has placed an order for 26 of the aircraft, as well as three Scorpene-class submarines. These purchases show how far India has gone to diversify its armaments purchases, while also distancing itself from Russian arms manufacturers. China has already said no to the Su-57, as it's developing its own fifth-gen stealth fighter, the J-20 Super Dragon, which itself will eventually be replaced by an even better model, their as-yet unnamed sixth-gen advanced stealth fighter, which is still under development and not expected to see full production until sometime after 2026. Then there's Russia's failed export sale of existing Su-35 planes to Iran. They had a deal in place for Iran to purchase up to 50 already built Su-35s, an agreement concluded in 2014 during the second term of President Hassan Rouhani. According to a former Iranian diplomat, at the time of purchase, Russia had promised to deliver the Su-35s in 2023, but neither Iran nor Russia is expecting the planes to be delivered this year. Whether the unexpected loss of so many aircraft in the Ukraine invasion is to be blamed for this delay, or as some have speculated, Israel was able to dissuade Russia from sending Iran the planes, is still a matter of speculation. Either way, not sending aircraft that have already been paid for sends a strongly negative signal to any other potential buyers of Russian armaments. Which leads us to our next question, posed by many Western commentators. 
Is the Su-57 actually the worst stealth fighter in any modern air force? When taking into account its comparatively poor RCS, its unreliable engines, its pitifully small production numbers, and its reliance on fiberglass framing instead of stealth coating, it seems that it's not really even comparable to the current best stealth aircraft, the F-22 and the F-35, and might even be considered less satisfactory than the Chinese J-20, which seems to many analysts to be a pirated copy of the F-22 Raptor, built with stolen technology. Henry Kelsall, military analyst and aviation expert, says, Russia's Su-57 Felon is a troubled aircraft and a poor stealth fighter, with an abnormally high radar cross-section and just 10 in active service. He adds, it's an aircraft that should have stealth capabilities, but the Su-57 falls remarkably short in this area. Aircraft such as the F-22 Raptor and F-35 Lightning II have it beaten in this department. As such, it's arguable that the Su-57 is the world's worst stealth aircraft currently in service. Russian President Vladimir Putin, on the other hand, seems to be willing to claim it's not only not that bad, but that the Felon is the best stealth fighter in the world. This is the world's best plane by all its operational characteristics and its armament, Putin said about the Su-57, according to a report broadcast by Russian news agency TASS. No other aircraft in the world can fly as well as our plane. This is the true reason why Russia can't afford to have one of their few Su-57s shot down. If the West were to get their hands on a shot-down felon and discover, as many analysts have pointed out, that this plane is nothing more than a souped-up fourth-gen fighter, then its chances of ever being sold to overseas buyers would vanish in a heartbeat. The aviation writer, ex-Marine and foreign policy and defense technology analyst Alex Hollings says, The Su-57 isn't quite as advanced, quite as capable, or quite as stealthy as the other three fighters of its generation. As far as their effectiveness in the Ukraine invasion, he added, to date, there are so few Su-57s in existence that any capability they offer the Russian military is superficial at best. Russia will likely keep the Felon within its own territory and will only operate it when the plane is out of Ukrainian surface-to-air missile range, which is from 60 to 90 miles. A shootdown of the vaunted Su-57 would be a terrible blow to Russia and a public relations bonanza for the Ukrainians and its allies in the West. So whether its stealthiness is as bad as its many detractors suggest, the Su-57 Felon is one plane that Ukraine will probably never see flying through the skies. But what do you think? Will Putin ever send the Su-57 into battle? If so, do you think it will live up to the hype he's generated around it? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. Back in 2020, Putin made some big promises. By big promises, we mean one specific, armor-piercing, rapidly moving, supposedly impenetrable promise. You know what we're talking about, and it starts with a T and ends with a laser-guided missile explosion. The T-14 Armata. Putin vowed to manufacture this alleged Abrams killer, by far the strongest and most technically advanced Russian tank ever designed, in mass quantities. You can't say the guy doesn't dream big, but sometimes dreams turn into nightmares. And that's exactly what happened to the Russian dictator who is now facing an incomprehensible shortage of tanks on the battlefield in Ukraine. And we're not just talking about the T-14, which is more or less ghosting this war completely. The guy is running low on every kind of clanky, antiquated Soviet-era hardware and tanks you can think of. The Russian army is currently trying to fight off the latest and greatest Western tanks and IFVs, including American-made M1 Abrams, German-made Leopard 2s and British-made Challengers, and they are failing at trying to get any real headway in these battles. Would things be different if Russia had more T-14 Armatas at its disposal? In an epic battle between the T-14 Armata and, say, the German Leopard 2, who would win? Let's lay down the stats and find out. But first, a quick review of the T-14 Armata's complicated backstory, filled with red flags that Putin clearly ignored to his own demise. In 2015, the Russian armed forces revealed the T-14 Armata, a highly secretive next-generation main battle tank based on the Armata Universal Combat Platform. The Universal Armata design was originally intended to serve as a starting point for the next generation of Russian heavy infantry fighting vehicles IFVs, and armored personnel carriers AFVs. This was a common starting point among the world's strongest militaries in the 1970s and 1980s but the Russians came to the game late, starting development on the Armata platform in 2009. 
The thought was that if you could build a modular next-generation tracked vehicle platform, you'd be able to slap all manner of mission-specific systems onto it according to the needs and dictates of the intended mission. Yes, you could have a powerful main battle tank, but you'd also have the basis of a fleet of combat engineering vehicles, air defense units, armored personnel carriers, tank support vehicles, and self-propelled artillery, if you wanted, ones that all run on the exact same engine, fuel, and spare parts. Ultimately, if you could pull it off, it would vastly simplify maintenance procedures and decrease production costs. But here's the problem. Mission modularity is touted as the one-stop solution to all your tactical, technological, engineering, and budgetary challenges. But in reality, universal platforms can force designers to limit a system's maximum performance by imposing artificial, fiscal, and technological constraints in the name of efficiency and integration. It's okay when the extent of the modularity is limited to, say, the seats on an aircraft, which can easily be removed to make it a cargo versus a passenger transport. But when you scale it up, swapping turrets on a tank chassis to make it an indirect artillery platform in the spur of a moment, there's little chance a universal system will outperform a counterpart which has been expressly designed for the prescribed combat role. Like the rest of the West, Russia has veered away from making the Armata Universal Combat Platform the darling of its motorized ground forces, mostly because it can't anymore. When it was first announced, the T-14 sent the Western world into a frenzy. Could the existing Western main battle tanks hold their weight against the latest Russian offering? On paper, at least, it was close. They had similar armament, top speeds, and armor. With its isolated crew compartment and automated turret, the T-14 may have been able to better protect its operators. It had marginally better range, muzzle energy, fuel efficiency, and maintenance potential than even the American M1 Abrams. But the robust 40-year-old Abrams and Leopard designs with their modern suite of upgrade packages would almost certainly hold their own in a firefight. Which did not bode well for Russia, since by the time they announced the T-14, there were already 10,000 operable Abrams and more than 3,600 Leopard 2s produced and in use around the world. As it turned out, there wasn't much to worry about. The first batch of 12 Armata tanks was delivered in 2015. Despite plans to ultimately acquire 2,300 T-14 tanks by 2025, there are still virtually no Armatas in use throughout the Russian armed forces. As the Armata program was beset by production issues, financial problems, and trial delays, its initial acquisition was scaled back to just 100 experimental vehicles, a number that Russia has fallen well short of reaching. So what's the German Leopard 2's backstory? For one, it had a far more optimal service history since its inception in 1979. It was something of a surprise when the German military started designing the Leopard 2 just a few years after it had come out with the Leopard 1 which had only been in service for about a decade, a very short shelf life for a main battle tank. From the start, the Leopard 1 had been a staple of European defense, with more than 4,700 tanks and 1,741 utility and anti-aircraft variants produced. You can still find upgraded Leopard 1s out there in the wild if you travel to Greece, Turkey, Brazil, or Chile, but by and large, most Leopard-adopting militaries have adopted its more modern counterpart, the third-generation Leopard 2, from Poland to Singapore. Updating the Leopard 1 was a decision made in direct response to improvements in Soviet armor during the later stages of the Cold War. West Germany knew it occupied a strategically vital position on NATO's front lines with the Soviet Union. If the Soviets decided to attack, West Germany needed a competitive main battle tank to resist the threat. Fortunately, they succeeded in developing a tank that far outmatched its Soviet opponents. Ironically, the Leopard 2 began its life as a joint development program with the United States to develop a next-generation MBT. The MBT-70 program that eventually spawned the Leopard couldn't quite meet the requirements of either nation, so the US went off to work on the M1 Abrams while Germany returned to its Leopard 1 and began asking how they could take it to the next level. Under the management of Porsche engineers, the Germans concluded that the new platform could incorporate improved engine transmission upgrades, a coaxial auto cannon, heavier rounds, extendable surveillance cameras, and an independent commander's periscope to improve the crew's situational awareness. While they were there, they decided to beef up the tank's main gun from 105 to the 120mm smoothbore the Leopard retains to this day. The West Germans wanted to see how they were doing so far, so in 1976, they sent a prototype to the US for inspection by American engineers. 
The Leopard was as agile, if not more, than the American prototype Abrams XM1 in development. They found the Leopard 2 and the XM1 were comparable in firepower and mobility, and that even though the Abrams could resist explosive kinetic energy penetration rounds slightly better, Leopard 2 crews were almost twice as well protected. The Leopard's engine was more reliable, it guzzled less gas, and it didn't have as large of a heat signature, even if it was noisier. The Leopard 2 hit the production line shortly after its American audition, having improved on its armor deficiencies. Like any MBT, it has undergone a series of regular systems upgrades that have improved its armor, survivability, firepower, and optics as technology has improved. There were a couple of baseline improvements over previous generations of MBTs that really set the Leopard 2 apart. It had blowout panels on the separator between the turret bustle, with its ready ammunition racks and the crew compartment. It had new thermal night sight systems, digital ballistic computers, improved fire extinguishing systems, improved frontal arc armor arrays, and side skirts that could add new ceramic and composite armor modular plating as required. The latest version of the Leopard is the 2A7, first released in 2014. A consistent string of upgrades have either been implemented or are scheduled to continue improving the platform ever since, which will be discussed in more detail later. Rheinmetall, the manufacturer of the Leopard and Abrams 120mm smoothbore guns, announced in 2015 that it would begin developing a new 130mm variant that would offer a 50% increase in performance in penetration. While Germany has announced the end of the Leopard's service life will likely come around 2030, and Germany and France are already jointly designing its replacement, the main ground combat system, there are more improvements to the Leopard 2A7 in the offing, including upgrades to the current L55 Cannon 120mm ammunition, as well as a new digital turret core system, situational awareness system, and an active protective system. The T-14 tank is capable in its own right. Coming in at a spry 55 tons, it is 12 tons lighter than the 67-ton Leopard 2. Powered by a turbocharged 1500-horsepower 12-speed automatic diesel engine, the T-14 is actually significantly faster on the road than the Leopard, capable of traveling 56 miles an hour to the Leopard's 43. Costing $4 to $5 million per unit, the Russian offering is also much cheaper to produce, almost half the cost of the Leopard. It is slightly more maneuverable, has adjustable suspension, and claims to have an operational range of 310 miles, 30 more than the Leopard's 280. If anything, the T-14 may well prove to be a trendsetter. It was, after all, the world's first production tank with an unmanned turret, a design feature the latest generation prototype American Abrams X will replicate. It possesses a larger 125mm smoothbore cannon, an autoloader, reactive armor, and the Afghanit Active Protective System APS, that helps it mitigate the impact of ATGMs that have absolutely eviscerated thousands of T-90s, T-80s, and T-72s that used to form the backbone of the Russian army. The Armata's three-man crew store their rounds in a sealed turret compartment separate from the cockpit. Likewise, the power plant, autoloader, and cockpits are sealed against nuclear, biological, and fire threats, something the Leopard's crew can also boast. Something unique about the T-14 is that it has a merged engine transmission unit that can be swapped in 30 minutes in the field and, in future variants, may be equipped with a massive 152mm gun, which can fire guided missiles capable of shattering armor twice as thick as the Leopard's. But speaking of unique features, the Leopard has a few tricks up its own turret. Modern combined operations are undertaken across a variety of terrains and geographic features, waterways and rivers among them. The interior of the Leopard 2 can be sealed, waterproofed, and equipped with a snorkel enabling the vehicle to traverse bodies of water taller than the tank itself. If it needs to, the crew can have up to 12 hours of life support in this sealed configuration, giving its occupants ample protection against the worst chemical and nuclear threats it might encounter on the battlefield. If the temperature rises above 180 degrees, automatic firefighting systems will engage to put the fire out. In terms of armor protection, defense estimates figure that the Leopard 2 had the equivalent protection of 1,840 to 2,920 mm of armor against kinetic energy projectiles, and 2,700 to 4,370 mm of armor protection against chemical explosive rounds. The Leopard 2A6 went even farther. 
improving the crew survivability with protection equivalents of 5,890mm to 7,800mm of armor versus kinetic penetrators, and 9,000 to 11,500mm of armor versus chemical explosive rounds. Leopard crews can feel safe driving over a variety of IEDs and mines with robust belly armor. Spall liners inside the hull prevent the deadly fracturing of internal armor plates when an explosive projectile hits the external armor but does not penetrate it, something that can actually incapacitate or kill a crew without leaving much of a visible trace on the exterior of the vehicle. The Leopard 2 can fire several different types of rounds. The German DM-33 discarding Sabbat anti-tank round would be one of the most common in a head-to-head -head matchup, capable of penetrating 960 mm of steel armor at a range of 2,000 meters. The Leopard 2A7's new L55 cannon barrel is longer than its predecessor, giving ammunition improved penetrating power. The German tank can fire Leihat anti-tank guided missiles up to 3.6 miles away through the main gun, something the Armata allegedly claims it can do up to a distance of 5 miles, which could be the deciding factor in a one-on-one -on -one tank duel. In terms of capacity, the Leopard houses 42 rounds inside the crude turret, 15 additional rounds on the left side of the turret bustle, and 27 stored rounds in a specially protected hull magazine. The Armata, for its part, can hold 45 rounds. Both tanks have an array of 12.7 and 7.62mm machine guns in addition to their main guns for suppressive fire against infantry and smaller mechanized targets. Next generation sensors and optics are the norm in both models, but this is where the proven Leopard shines. It has a stabilized optical periscope for day and night operations, one that integrates fiber optic gyros, laser rangefinders, image fusion functioning, daylight cameras, and a thermal imaging device. The Leopard's gunner station incorporates a stabilized main sight and an auxiliary targeting telescope, while the driver can maneuver the tank into position using the tank's built-in night vision and thermal drive systems. If the Armata actually existed, we would find a capable foe. It possesses multispectral sights with laser rangefinders, thermals, and wide-angle cameras offering its crew 360-degree situational awareness. Its automated fire control system uses an advanced battlefield management system to analyze targeting data using the tank's built-in muzzle reference system and range sensors. This would certainly give the crew a leg up, as long as all the systems could be kept in good working order. The T-14's turret uses electrical armament stabilization and can fire programmable ammunition, like the gun-launched anti-tank guided missiles previously noted, expressly designed to destroy tanks and even helicopters. It's also worth noting that the T-14 is networked for guidance with other T-14s. They can be aided by a drone cable attachment that can be used indefinitely to distinguish targets using day or night vision, infrared and add distance and target guidance data. This means if one tank's drone sees a target, the others will too. The Armata, as you can tell, is a tank purpose-built for the digital age. Good luck killing its crew, too. Its forward-based three-man crew are tightly cocooned in a futuristic steel capsule developed by Russian scientists to be 15% lighter than normal steel, yet withstand insanely heavier blast and heat ratings. Russian engineers wrapped this reinforced steel crew compartment in layers of classified composite ceramic plating. Russian engineers took things a step further. The forward position of the tank boasts a revolutionary Malekit dual explosive reactive armor system that can offset the impact of an RPG or anti-tank round in the front, sides, and top of the tank. In the rear, bar armor adds a few additional inches of potentially life-saving buffer space between the point of impact and the rear armor itself. Like most modern MBTs, the T-14 utilizes an APS system with five rocket launchers on either side of the tank that comes in two versions, hard and soft kill versions. Hard kill systems intercept and disable incoming munitions with projectiles of their own, while soft kill systems interfere with the electronic guidance or stabilization mechanisms of incoming rounds using things like laser dazzlers. The Russian-designed Afghanit system is the first in the world to incorporate both in a single system using millimeter wave radar to target a variety of enemy rounds, including kinetic energy penetrators and tandem charge weapons, like the US-manufactured Javelin. It's not been proven to work 100% of the time, but it's pretty good, analysts believe, at deflecting and destroying artillery shells and unguided rockets that are common on the modern battlefield. 
and interfering with ATGM guidance systems. Some Russians even say it can protect T-14 crews against the depleted uranium kinetic penetrators in common use among American tank crews, but we'll believe that when we see it. Along those lines, there are almost more unknowns than knowns surrounding the T-14 project, like whether it has actually participated in war games or live-fire events, whether the 55-ton tank could actually achieve the same level of survivability as the sturdier Leopard, or whether its autoloader system is as reliable as claimed. What we do know is that there is a reason American tank crews rely on good old quality German engineering and precision by adapting the exact same turret and barrel configuration as the Leopard 2. The Leopard 2 systems can keep its gun leveled no matter what terrain it is traversing, even if it's on a hilly terrain or crossing a busy road. After firing, the barrel snaps back to its initial position in the blink of an eye. Hold my beer, T-14, literally. There's a famous promotional video showing a Leopard 2 holding a Stein of German beer on the tip of its turret while it casually launches itself over an obstacle course, and as you might expect, not a drop spills out. As far as we know, the T-14 has more vertical and horizontal recoil, something you don't see on the Leopard, and is slightly less stable than the German model which could delay the target acquisition for its next firing. Ultimately, the Leopard has slightly heavier armor, but the Armata is faster, can travel farther, and is much cheaper to produce, though apparently not cheap enough for the Russian MOD. It also has an autoloader with a heavier primary gun effective up to 5 kilometers. Using its 3 UBK-21 Sprinter ATGMs, that range increases up to 12 kilometers. Both tanks have not, as yet, faced advanced tanks of their same generation in combat. Yes, the T-14 takes a lot of flack. We laugh because the tank broke down in its first public outing at the 2015 Moscow Victory Day Parade. I'm sure Putin would bite your arm off for a mechanically challenged T-14 to parade around these days. He could only drum up a single T-34 for this year's iteration, even though the decision to do so was likely motivated by legitimate security concerns. Still, in a hypothetical one-on-one -on -one battle that blatantly ignores today's geopolitical realities, the fact of the matter is that the Russian tank incorporates and surpasses many of the design features that make the Leopard 2 as great as it is. The armored crew capsule and automated turret offer greater protection and lethality. Its next-generation APS system, high-fidelity sensors, and computer targeting would lend it marked but not decisive advantage. But the fact that the existing Leopard is a time-tested main battle tank of over 40 years with a formidable base platform that will be continually improved upon and upgraded through 2030 is a huge mark in its favor. Only the German government and certain foreign buyers know what kind of next-generation equipment has found its way into the Leopard 2A7+, so it's impossible to know how it would fare in a fight. Already capable of matching up against the T-14 Armata, the fact remains that the price of upgrading existing and already manufactured Leopards with next-generation technology is far cheaper than producing a new T-14, something Russia can't even dream of as the economic and military consequences of its ill-planned invasion of Ukraine mount. In the end, the accuracy of rangefinders, sensors, and targeting computers would most likely determine the outcome of this tank duel. As one commentator noted, Small differences in lethality will likely matter less if one tank is able to see the other, while the other cannot detect at similar ranges. The tank that can find, target, and hit the other from the longer range is likely to prevail in any kind of war engagement. It would be rare to actually find ourselves in a scenario where both tanks are hunting the other. With the ubiquity of drones and aerial surveillance, tank battles a la Kursk have become relics of a bygone era. Even if the T-14 boasts greater reach, with its laser-guided rounds and rate of fire with its automatic loading mechanism, it wouldn't matter as much as we might like to think. Isolated and unsupported as most Russian tanks have been in Ukraine, the T-14 would be an easy and favorable target to Ukrainian infantry, who would just as soon engage it with a far cheaper Javelin or AT-4 than a Leopard of their own. The true difference maker, however, in a fight between the Leopard 2 and the T-14 Armata would likely not be in the tank's technology, armament, or munitions, but in the quality of its crews, and you can take that to the bank. This is where the Leopard, or any modern Western tank for that matter, would truly shine. Operated by competent, well-trained crews with effective NCOs, something the Russians no longer have, tanks are only as good as the humans inside them. With a strong emphasis on combined and joint operations, traditional Leopard tank crews would almost certainly benefit from NATO air superiority, better intelligence, 
and integration with remote assets and battlefield management internal systems, not to mention far greater interoperability with other NATO standard vehicles. Ukraine may lack much air superiority, but it will still be receiving training on how to properly employ them from some of the best instructors in the world. Technology and resilient systems matter on the modern battlefield and will continue to matter in the future, but where these factors fail, discipline, cohesion and training will take care of the rest. Until the Armata actually enters the production line, something that for Russia may never even happen, as recent reports indicate that in the light of recent military setbacks, it has halted its 20 trillion ruble program altogether. One-on-one -on -one showdowns between it and the Leopard 2 will likely remain confined to our imagination. But if you had to pick one, who would you go with? Let us know in the comments. How incompetent can Putin get? Since the war in Ukraine started, he's been losing tanks by the dozens on a daily level. His military has been unable to deliver powerful air and artillery strikes or apply modern military tactics and strategies, and the list doesn't stop there. When Russia launched its full-scale invasion of Ukraine, the world's attention was naturally riveted on the land war. There, Russia's poor command structure and logistical incompetence became apparent within the first week, with the attack on Kyiv stalling. Since then, Russia has been forced to take hundreds of thousands of casualties in a war of attrition that has raged for 20 months and counting. However, Russia's incompetence has extended to the seas as well. In the build-up to the conflict and early stages of the war, military observers feared that Russia would quickly take control of the seas and stage an amphibious attack on Odessa, Ukraine's third largest city. If Russia took Odessa, it would essentially cut Ukraine off from the Black Sea entirely and leave it a poor, landlocked rump state. Such fears proved unfounded. A landing near Odessa never came. Instead, the biggest stories involving Russia's navy in this war have been of its numerous humiliations. What happened? Today, Russia has essentially ceded control of the Western Black Sea and is increasingly not even safe within its haven in Crimea. But why has the Russian navy proven so ineffective in the war? To be as fair as we can to Russia, it is and always has been in a bad geostrategic position with regards to the sea. Ever since the days of Peter the Great, Russia has aspired to be a sea power. However, geography makes this difficult to do, as its ports are either contained within choke points, freeze over in the winter, or both. The quest for improved access to the sea has been a vital objective for Russia's foreign policy since the early 18th century, and Russia has never quite been able to achieve this goal. Even at the height of its power during the Soviet Union, unrestricted access to the sea was an objective that still eluded Moscow. In this light, it is understandable why Russia places such a high strategic importance on Crimea and why it was willing to use military force to secure it. It is one of Russia's few warm water ports. Unfortunately for the Russians, there's a problem. The Turks command the transit points between the Black and Mediterranean seas through their control of the Bosporus and Dardanelles. This control was formalized through the 1936 Montreux Convention regarding the regime of the Straits. The convention allows complete freedom of transit for the commercial vessels of any country through these straits during peacetime. In times of war, however, Turkey, if it is not a party to the conflict, can close the straits to transiting ships unless they are returning to their bases. Three days after Russia invaded Ukraine, Turkey invoked the Montreux Convention's wartime provisions for the first time, refusing Russian naval vessels in the Mediterranean access to the Black Sea. For example, at the end of November 2022, two Russian warships left the Mediterranean through the Suez Canal after nine months of idling after Turkey forbid them from transiting through the Dardanelles and Bosporus to the Black Sea. The effect of the Montreux Convention has been to cut off Russia's ability to reinforce its Black Sea fleet. For Ukraine, this was a significant piece of diplomatic aid. It immediately made Russian naval officers more cautious, knowing that every ship in the fleet was precious. Even so, it seemed far-fetched that Ukraine would be able to significantly impede the operations of the Russian Black Sea Fleet. That opinion quickly started to change, however. Ukraine proved its ability to strike at the Russian Navy early in the war. Three days after it invaded Ukraine, and on the same day the Turks invoked the Montreux Convention, Russia captured the strategically important port of Berdyansk. The Ukrainian military and Western observers were understandably concerned that the Russian ships that piled into Berdyansk could either land troops in the rear of Ukraine's southern lines or attack Odessa. Then, at about 7.45 a.m. on March 24th, exactly a month after the invasion, 
the landing craft Saratov mysteriously exploded and sank in port at Badyansk. Ships of the Saratov's class, the Alligator-class tank landing ship, can land up to 425 soldiers or marines with armored support of either 40 infantry fighting vehicles or 20 tanks. The loss of this vessel was thus a significant blow to Russia's ability to conduct amphibious operations. How did this happen? From the beginning of the conflict, NATO has provided Ukraine with excellent intelligence, and Ukraine's intelligence units got the word that the Saratov was loaded with munitions at the time of the attack. Ukraine used this intelligence and a Cold War-era Tochka-U Scarab short-range ballistic missile to carry out the deed. The Tochka-U has a range of about 120 kilometers. We do not know how many of these missiles Ukraine used in the attack, but what is known is that Russia's modern air defense systems should have easily been able to intercept these Soviet weapons. Russian media at the time reported that its forces had done just that, although the real story came in July, when the Saratov was raised from the depths of the sea. Russia's supposedly modern air defense network failed to act against a much older weapon system. Meanwhile, two other ships, the Seza Kunikov and Novichokask, were seen on video departing from the flaming Saratov. They also suffered damage in the attack and were forced to retreat to Crimea. Eleven sailors on board the Saratov died in the incident. Ukraine's next assault on the Russian Navy would become the most famous of the war. This was the sinking of the cruiser Moskva, the flagship of Russia's Black Sea Fleet, in April 2022. This incident was apparently so humiliating for Russia that its Ministry of Defense still offers no details about what happened and avoids talking about it in public, to the point that the families of the sailors on board are still left in the dark about the fates of their loved ones. How exactly this incident unfolded is still unclear. After the successful attack, American sources reported that the Ukrainians had used liquid-fueled Neptune anti-ship cruise missiles, sending them to coordinates provided by U.S. intelligence by way of a P-8 Poseidon maritime surveillance aircraft that flew out of Italy and looked around the Black Sea. Ukraine denied this report, however. According to the Ukrainians, April 13, 2022 was the worst day to sink the cruiser because the weather was so bad for such a precise, premeditated attack. The coastline was covered with low, dark rain clouds on that day. The Ukrainian radars in the area had a limited 18-kilometer range because of the bad weather. Knowing this, the Moskva's crew got a wee bit careless. According to Ukrainian sources, at the time of the invasion, we had no over-the-horizon radars and Russia knew it. But since the clouds were very low and a signal in this corridor between the water and the clouds had nowhere to go, the radar suddenly reached and identified Moskva. The ship's crew seemingly ignored this potentially deadly situation and were so lax about their security that the air defense systems were inactive. They had not noticed that they had just sailed to within the Neptune's 200-kilometer range. Ukraine may have at this point used a Turkish Bayraktar TB2 drone to distract the Moskva and then launch the missiles. For a while after the attack, Ukrainian crews did not know what happened but radar soon revealed that four Russian ships were rushing to the Moskva from different directions. Later, the Ukrainians realized that a tugboat had also been dispatched from Crimea, hoping to save the ailing ship. At this point, the weather cooperated again too, when a storm began at sea and made rescue operations much harder. It became impossible to save the Moskva then, and it sank beneath the waves. Hundreds of Russian sailors reportedly saw their flagship get hit by two Neptune missiles. The Moskva incident is more baffling because the ship was an air defense cruiser. If running properly, the Moskva should have gotten as much as four minutes of warning that the Ukrainian cruise missiles were on their way. The Russian cruiser also had a triple layer of protection against such air attacks. Its defenses included the S-300F surface-to-air missiles, 9K-33 OSA air defense missiles, AK-360 close-in 30mm cannons, chaff, decoys, and electronic defense systems. However, no one recorded the Moskva using any of these systems against the Ukrainian cruise missiles. The ship just sat there. Why were none of these systems active? Was the ship's radar system defective? We might never know the answer. Whatever the reason, the Moskva was the largest Russian vessel sunk since World War II and the first loss of a Russian flagship since the Russo-Japanese War. Russia says that 18 crew members died. Other sources say it was as many as 600. Either way, the incident shocked the Kremlin, 
with Ukraine's demonstrated anti-ship capabilities and no way for it to bring replacements thanks to the Turks' invocation of the Montreux Convention, Russia became even more cautious about how it would use its naval assets. Since this incident, the Black Sea Fleet has been bottled up around its base in Sevastopol, Crimea. With this knowledge, Ukrainian troops confidently strode forward with their Kherson counteroffensive between August and November of 2022, safe in the knowledge that the Russian Navy would not be bothering them with missile attacks from the Black Sea, let alone amphibious operations behind their lines. Even with the Russian Navy's retreat to the relatively safe Crimea, Ukraine wasn't done showing off its prowess in sinking ships. Next up was the rescue tug for Sili Bek. While far less spectacular a target than the Moskva, these tugs are important to the maintenance of a naval fleet. This role is especially important in the Black Sea due to Russia's inability to reinforce its fleet. This ship was new too, being launched in 2016 and commissioned in 2017. On June 17, 2022, Ukrainian forces attacked the Vasily Bek when it was on its way to resupply Russian soldiers stationed on Snake Island, a place already made famous from the start of the war when the garrison there used colorful language in response to Russia's demands for surrender. The Ukrainians hit the Vasily Bek with two Harpoon anti-ship cruise missiles. The ship stood no chance and went down, with about 10 Russian KIA in the incident and a $25 million Tor air defense system on board that was supposed to be placed on the island. On June 30th, Russia evacuated its garrison from Snake Island. Moscow claimed that this move was an act of goodwill in recognition of a humanitarian corridor that was part of its grain export deal with Ukraine. In reality, Russia evacuated its troops from Snake Island because the attack on the Vasily Bek made its military brass realize that it's too risky to reinforce and resupply the outpost. It was a tacit admission that Russia had ceded the Black Sea west of Crimea to Ukraine. But the Ukrainians weren't done yet. The Olenogorsky Gorniak, a Rapucha-class landing ship, was Ukraine's next target. On August 4, 2023, Ukraine used drone boats to swarm the ship and its neighbors when it was docked in the Black Sea port of Novorossiysk. Not all the drones made it through Russian defenses, but the attack on the Olenogorsky Gorniak succeeded. The ship did not sink, but it needed to be put in a dry dock to repair the heavy damage. It's unlikely that the ship will return to action anytime soon. The water drone Ukraine used in the attack was a new, low-visibility grey boat that can be operated via remote control. The drone boat has a high payload, able to carry a 300kg warhead up to a range of 800 kilometers. The boat also features a satellite communications array at its rear. A Ukrainian operator of these drones explained their low profile was designed to exploit weaknesses in Russian ship defenses. It was an adaptation from their earlier attacks, where Russian ships spotted drone boats and sank them with artillery and small arms fire once they got to within visual range. The attack on the Olenogorsky Gorniak reveals that Ukraine has absorbed these lessons and is adapting with its newer drone boats. Russia claims that it foiled a similar attack on an oil facility after this incident, but as always, these claims should be treated with skepticism. Most recently, Ukraine attacked targets in Sevastopol, the headquarters of Russia's Black Sea Fleet, and other targets in Crimea. On September 13th, Ukrainian forces struck the Sergo Ordzonikidze shipyard in Sevastopol, a major repair base. Ukraine reportedly used 10 Franco-British Storm Shadow cruise missiles in the attack. Russia's Ministry of Defense claims that air defense systems in the area shot seven of these missiles down, but that effort was clearly not enough. The Russian Kilo-class diesel-electric submarine Rostov-on-Don and the large landing ship Minsk were struck and destroyed by the storm shadows. Key infrastructure on the base was also damaged in this incident. However, the missile attack was only the climax of the operation. Other units were essential for shaping it. Prior to the attack, Ukrainian special operators seemed to have destroyed one of Russia's nearby S-400 air defense systems and took control of an oil facility that housed a local radar unit. By downing these systems, the Ukrainians set the stage for the strike on Sevastopol. It would only be the first of several attacks on Crimean targets in the weeks ahead. On September 14th, Ukraine again struck at the Russian Navy on the seas. Its general staff said it had targeted two ships in the Western Black Sea and released a video showing a Russian patrol ship appearing to come under attack by drone boats. The Russian Ministry of Defense confirmed that one of its ships, the Sergei Kotov, had been attacked, but repelled the assault. Meanwhile, that same day, Ukrainian forces used cruise missiles and drones to destroy a Russian air defense network in the Crimean city of Yevpatoria. 
Then, on September 22nd, Ukraine launched another attack on Sevastopol. Ukraine sent several Storm Shadow cruise missiles at targets there. Russia claims that it shot most of them down, but one made it through, hitting the Black Sea Fleet's headquarters. The attack set the main building ablaze, and Russian officials said at least one service member went missing in the aftermath. Ukraine alleges that the strike was timed to coincide with a meeting of high-level Russian officials. Kirillo Budanov, Ukraine's intelligence chief, says that two Russian commanders were badly injured in the attack. Later, Ukraine's special operations forces said the strike had killed Viktor Sokolov, the commander of Russia's Black Sea Fleet, along with 33 others. No independent source verified this claim, however. Sokolov reportedly attended a soccer awards ceremony to prove he was not dead on September 27th, although there are claims that this was a duplicate. As always, we should know more in time. What we do know is that the Institute for the Study of War confirmed an attack on the 744th Communications Center of the Command of the Black Sea Fleet in Crimea. And the problems are only piling on for Russia. In late September, the Biden administration seemingly finally gave Ukraine what it has wanted for so long. Although it was not officially announced, it's likely that Ukraine will be getting ATAC ms missiles in the near future. These weapons can hit targets up to 300 kilometers away, 50 kilometers further than the Storm Shadow. And unlike the Storm Shadow, which requires a riskier launch from a fighter jet, ATAC ms can be fired from Ukraine's HIMARS platforms on the ground. ATAC ms would be ideal for launching attacks on Sevastopol. Meanwhile, if Ukraine gets ATAC ms it's also possible that Germany will agree to supply Ukrainians with Taurus air-launched cruise missiles that have even greater range than ATAC ms This weapon system would be ideal for targeting the Kerch Bridge connecting Crimea to the Russian mainland. A drone attack already damaged the Kerch Bridge a year ago. This scenario would be far more threatening. Ukraine has renewed its attacks on Crimea for a few reasons. First, Russia has allowed the grain export deal that Turkey and the UN brokered in July 2022 to expire. Russia's Black Sea Fleet has resumed its blockade of such exports, making it a more important target for Ukraine to destroy. Crimea is also the linchpin of Russia's logistics in Ukraine. Being able to resupply its troops from Crimea is vital to the Russian war effort. Ukrainian disruption of Russian Navy logistics from Crimea is one of the reasons why Moscow now considers it too dangerous to send ships to the west of the peninsula. An attack on Russia's ports in Crimea would disrupt the supply chain to all the branches of Russia's military, and it appears that the Black Sea Fleet is helpless in stopping such attacks. Crimea is also a highly political target, with Ukrainian President Zelensky saying that this war started in Crimea and will end in Crimea. The recapture of Crimea would be the greatest victory for the Ukrainian military, a highly symbolic measure of its triumph. The stakes are just as high, or even higher, for Putin. Prior to the invasion of Ukraine, he sold his occupation and annexation of Crimea to the Russian public as his crowning foreign policy achievement. If Russian occupation of Crimea becomes untenable through missile and drone attacks, and supplying the Russian forces in other parts of Ukraine from Crimea also becomes untenable, Putin's political position at home erodes and the entire Russian war effort risks breaking down. The war has already put Russia through isolation, economic hardship, and hundreds of thousands of casualties. If Russia cannot gain anything from the hostilities and winds up losing Crimea too, or if it at least cannot use the peninsula for strategic purposes, it's difficult to see how Putin would be able to remain in power, which he plans to do until at least 2036. In this scenario, Russian elites may decide that the time is right for their country to finally get a new leader. There is a presidential election in Russia in 2024. Although elections in Russia are only formalities, the 2024 election could serve as a pretext to oust Putin from power if the war goes too poorly between now and then. It's understandable why Crimea and the Black Sea Fleet would become an increasingly high priority for Ukraine. All wars are first and foremost political. Even if things don't turn out that way, Ukraine's effective neutralization of the Russian Black Sea Fleet is an astounding military achievement. Early in the war, Ukraine forced the Black Sea Fleet to retreat to what it believed was the safety of Crimea. Now, through the actions of its intelligence units, special operators, and missile and air units, it's showing that not even Crimea is safe. If ATAC ms and Taurus missiles soon arrive, that point will only be made clearer. What do you think will come next in the war at sea? Will Ukraine soon use ATAC ms missiles to destroy Russian ships and docks in Sevastopol? Is the Kerch Bridge safe for Russia? 
Let us know what you think in the comments. Also, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more military analysis from military experts.